Good evening. It is November 1st, 2022. On July 16th of this year, an act was signed into law which extends the suspension of certain provisions of the open meeting law. This allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present at a meeting location while providing the public with adequate alternative access to the meeting. This meeting is accessible in real time via Zoom, by phone, and on Amherst Media, and the room is open to the public. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I am calling the November 1st, 2022 Special Town Council meeting to order at 635. I'll call upon each counselor by name. At that time, you should unmute your mic and say present. This will indicate that you can hear us and we can hear you. After we're finished with this, I will then turn to the co-chairs of the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee to call their meeting to order as well. Uh, Shalini Balmel. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. Dorothy Pam. Here. Pam Rooney. Here. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. Alicia Walker. Here. All 13 counselors are present. Um, D and D Shabazz and Allegra Clark are the co-chairs and I call on them to call the CSSJC meeting to order. Um, D, you want me to do that? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so this is a joint meeting of the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee and the Town Council. Um, is 6 35 p.m on november 1st 2022 um so i'm going to make sure all members can hear me uh starting with d yes can you hear me yes thank you um i see philip next on my screen philip avila here thank you we can hear you um i see pat nanabaku yes Thank you. Um, I see Freke Ete. Present. Thank you. And is Deborah Ferrero with us? I don't see her in the audience or on the screen. I believe she said she was going to have some conflict um, this evening and might be calling in. So I just, I don't know if. Oh, there is a phone number. In the audience, it is one four four one three. I'm sorry. Just read the last four digits. So I'm sorry. Happens. It's four seven zero one. Are the last four digits? If that person is Deborah Ferraro, please raise your hand. It's not okay. Um, but we do have a quorum of our members present, so I am calling this meeting to order at 637. Thank you. Uh, there's no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let me know. Uh, to make a comment or ask a question, please click the raise hand button. If technical difficulties arise as a result of utilizing remote participation or technology in general, I'll decide how to address the situation um, Athena will be monitoring counselors' connections, and if necessary, we will pause the meeting until you are reconnected. There are various announcements on the agenda sheet, and we're not going to go through them at this time. Before we begin the substance of the agenda, I want to take a moment to reflect on the way in which our last meeting unfolded and especially the way in which it ended. One of my jobs as president is to make the process work. Our last meeting was not a good example of that. The motion to postpone the, mo the motion on the floor caught me a bit off guard and I struggled 
in the moment to come up with the best procedural response. Charter section 2.10C requires the debate on the motion on the floor must cease immediately. So that mu much was clear. In retrospect, that motion need not have stopped the discussion. Admittedly, it may have been quite difficult to have further discussion without getting into the substance of the proposed motion, but I, sh but I should have pursued that option. In addition, all counselors have the right to speak to their motion or in this case, speak to their right to exercise 210C of the charter based upon rules of procedure 7.2. In addition, any counselor has a right to question and or appeal the ruling of the person chairing the meeting. Because I didn't allow for either of these, I believe a difficult situation became even more tenuous. For all of these reasons, I am apologizing to the council, to the members of the CSSJC, and to all those who came to ex expecting to discuss the agenda item. I learned from my mistakes and will always endeavor to do better in the future. I might note that the more advanced notice I have of what counselors have in mind, the easier for me to work with them on their motions and to anticipate and manage any procedural pitfalls. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to make these comments. On to the agenda tonight. At the conclusion of the CSSJC meeting on October 17th, I immediately began a poll for a date to continue the discussion and address the motion that was postponed. Fortunately, the, the next day on October 18th at 3 p.m. at the Finance Committee meeting, which was posted as a council meeting, we agreed that the motion be taken up tonight at a time and date certain, Tuesday, November 1st, 6.30 p.m. The posted agenda tonight reflects this discussion from the meeting on October 17th, and that will continue, and that will be in a moment. However, this is preceded by a period of public comment. After concluding the discussion, the members of the CSSJC will remain in the room throughout the entire meeting, and the council will move to action items. In the packet, you will find a somewhat unusual item. It is a set of motions submitted by counselors prior to noon yesterday. Upon the suggestion of another counselor, I asked for this so we could all be prepared for the range of issues likely to come up and other motions may be introduced by counselors during the meeting. We cannot take up all motions at one time. We will begin later on during the action period with the motion proposed by Councillor Miller that was postponed on October 17th. That motion has already been made and seconded and therefore immediately comes back on the table and is open for discussion and action. I will recognize Michelle to pick up the thread of that motion and then I will recognize other counselors who wish to speak at that time. Following that and prior to any vote on any motion or amendment, there'll be another period of public comment, which includes the opportunity for any CSSJC member and the public to comment. After that, the council will return to debate and action by the council on any motion before us. During that time, counselors will also have an opportunity to make additional motions not presented on the motion sheet. Before I proceed to public comment, I'd like to ask all of those in the room if you have any questions about how we are going to proceed tonight. Dorothy. Um, I have to admit that my mind wanders when we get into all this procedural stuff. So I, I think I didn't hear an opportunity for the CSSJC to present. I mean, this is a joint meeting. Um, you, you, I think you said they could talk as part of public comment. I probably just didn't quite hear what you said. Um, you yes. probably, they do have a chance to speak 
besides public comment, right? After our initial public comment, there will be a general discussion. At that time, if the CSSJC have certain things they would like to present or discuss, that is an open discussion between both bodies. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Allegra? Sorry, forgot where the button was. Um, I just wanted to recognize that Deborah Ferreira is here. I don't know if that has to go on record, but I'd like to make sure we can hear her. Thank you, Allegra. I can hear you all. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Great. Uh, and thank you. That will go on the minutes. Uh, Kathy? Yeah, Lynn, I wasn't sure um, on the motion that's on the floor. Will we have a discussion on that and vote on it? before we look at the other motions, or will we first have a discussion, look at all the other motions, then come back and a vote? I wasn't sure how that will proceed. The motion is on the floor, and this will not happen until action items, which will be after the discussion period, okay? And we'll review all of that again at that time. But the motion that's on the floor, Michelle will be asked to either speak to that motion or make any other statement that she would like to at that time. We will not vote on any motions or amendments to motions until such time as we had another period of public comment. Okay, uh, I'm not sure that answered my question. Okay. If we have another period of public comment, then we come back and vote on the motion that's on the floor, or do we get to hear the other motions? Um, we cannot have you can have a motion on the floor. You can have a amendment to a motion on the floor. And you can have an amendment to that motion. And by Robert's rules of order, if I am correct, that is the maximum number of motions to be dealt with at any point in time. So when we get to that period of the agenda, we will go very slowly. If we need to take a pause to reinforce how we're doing things, we'll do that as well and make sure that whenever we're voting, people are very aware of what they're voting on. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments from those of us in the, in the room? I wanna make note that there are 60, I'm sorry, I see one from Andy. I think I have the same problem that Kathy may have because you asked counselors mm -hmm. if they wish to provide substitute motions. Those motions can't be made, but when do the makers of the motions have an opportunity to explain what it is that they've presented and why? Normally that would be at the time they would advance their motion. If the council would like, we can have a period of discussion before the motions and maybe that's the opportunity you're looking for. Does that help Andy? It helps. I think that it would be uh, just helpful to have a specific procedure because we had, I think, come into the meeting with the understanding that um, since those were presented and circulated, that there would be that opportunity so that uh, we would have a chance to talk about what were the reasons that um, substitute motions were being suggested, even though they can't be made or offered on the floor? Because as you point out, there can only be one motion on the floor. Um, Athena has her hand up. So since she and I, and particularly spent a fair amount of time coming up with a way to, for people to submit these motions. Um, Athena, would you like to speak? Yes, thank you. Um, when we discussed this earlier, we, I think we have a good idea of Robert's rules and um, the order of motions in the council's rules. And so we're gonna take those up as they come up and we'll try and explain the process and answer questions as they come up. Um, I think 
what 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 is happening right now is that there's a motion on the floor and we have to do something with that motion before something else can with before any other motions can be made so that motion can be amended that motion can be withdrawn and a new, new motion can be made but we're going to try and help that process along when we get to that point in the meeting um, so i don't think we can talk through every eventuality but i I think that we all have a handle on, uh, at least Lynn and Paul and I have a handle on those procedures and we'll try and answer questions and provide guidance when that comes up. Mandy Jo. Might I suggest when we get to that part of the agenda under action items and the motion is formally on the floor and we're discussing it, that the chair take a little bit of leeway to give counselors the ability to chat about potentially which motion they might prefer and reasons around all of that. Um, during that discussion, even though that might be a little bit out of technical <laughs> topic right. on the particular motion on the floor. Uh, that is fine with me if it's acceptable to the clerk of the council. Yes, it's up to the chair to Thank give you. guidelines about discussion. Thanks. Absolutely. All right. Uh, uh, now there are 71 people in the audience. This is the first of two public comment periods tonight. The second will occur during the discussion of the action item or items. If you would like to make a public comment, please raise your hand. Right now, I'm only seeing two hands. Are there any other people who would like to make public comment? No, there's one in person. I'm sorry. There's one in person. Okay. In the Just, of right. Shalini, you have your hand up as a counselor. Is there a question? Um, um, Dr. Patricia Romney had uh, emailed me with her public comment and she asked me to read it because she's unable to attend. So when do, would you like me to read that? Um, Let's take some of the public comments and then we'll work that in. Thank you, Shalini. Um, Zoe D. Fund, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hey, everybody. Can you hear me all right? You can, oh, we can hear you. I'm sorry, yes. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so my name is Zoe Crabtree and I live in District 5. I'm here tonight in support of the nine youth mistreated by the APD on July 5th and the CSSJC members who have been working hard to advocate for them. I'm disappointed at the way that the CSSJC has been treated uh, and how their concerns have been minimized and deprioritized for the past couple of months. Furthermore, I was uh, dismayed but not surprised to hear from one of the parents present on July 5th um, in a recent Indie article. Uh, that the APD misrepresented the course of events, uh, brought together disparate, disparate groups of youth into one big group ostensibly responsible for the noise complaint and didn't work to understand the parent who was already there and willing to take some of the youth home. Uh, incidents like this make it abundantly clear why noise complaints and other situations of this nature should be handled by Cress. Like many others tonight, uh, I'm demanding that the APD make a formal apology to the youth they harmed and to their families. Uh, I'm demanding that the town take full accountability for the APD's misconduct by having an independent investigation into the incident and releasing that report to the public. Additionally, um, the town uh, should create a compensation fund shaped and approved by the CSSJC for people impacted by police harassment and over surveillance. And uh, the town should hold know your rights workshops for youth and community members. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us, Zoe. Uh, Ronnie Parker, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, this is Ronnie Parker. I live in Amherst. Um, my general comment is that simply that I've been really feeling that in order to reconcile, there's a need for somebody to apologize. Um, because without acknowledgement of responsibility and without apology, I don't see how we're going to get to reconciliation. And in my mind, that's really the larger goal. So I just want to say how pleased I am that that was modeled quite unexpectedly by our 
Council Chair today at the start of this meeting, it's not so hard to do. And it, it really does help us all to be able to talk to each other and set aside any anger. So I wanna thank uh, Lynn for that opening. It really makes me feel optimistic. And I think that's the model, I hope that's the model we'll see more of this evening. Thank you. Ronnie, thank you for joining us. Bertie, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hello, uh, my name is Bertie Newman. I'm a Mount Holyoke student who remains deeply connected to my home in Amherst. Um, and I am also here to ask for justice for the Amherst Nine. This would include, um, among other things, an apology by the Amherst Police Department and the establishment of a compensation fund to support um, people in finding healing and joy after mistreatment by police. As the, Senate, as the Seven Generations Movement Collective found in their report in 2021, it is common for BIPOC residents to experience fear and mistreatment in interactions with the Amherst police. Moving forward in situations like these is not only about figuring out what is illegal, what is legal, what is an abuse of power. There are also some things that we just know. We know members of the Amherst Police Department behaved in a way that caused local youth distress. And we know that they frequently behave in ways that cause BIPOC town residents distress. We can take steps to remedy these harms. I'm grateful to the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee for envisioning a way forward. And I hope the rest of the town government listens attentively to their voices and follows their lead. Thank you so much. Bertie, thank you for joining us. Kathleen Anderson, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Can I be heard? Yes, you can. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say that I am extremely, extremely disappointed in the white members of the town of Amherst for allowing this behavior to take place. There have been decades of work around social justice issues and white privilege in the town of Amherst. And it is just insane that white people continue to um, engage in these kinds of misbehaviors against the black and colored citizens of Amherst. One would think that these people in this community would know better. And so now it's time for you to stand up. It's time for you to hold the police accountable for the racist behavior in which they engage with students of color and other people of color in this town. You should be ashamed that this kind of action is taking place. It represents who you are as white people and you need to stop it. And that's all I have to say. Kathleen, thank you for joining us. John Bonifaz, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Yes, my name is John Bonifaz. I live in Amherst. And I wanna make two points tonight in this general comment. First around accountability, just to build off of what Kathleen just said, we do need accountability when we see this kind of police misconduct. And for months now, we've not seen any kind of accountability. We've seen a statement by the police chief that the police officer involved has told these young people they have no rights, that he regrets saying that. But there's no accountability for this police officer's misconduct. And that's critical. As I said in a prior meeting, not every police officer is going to tell young people that they don't have any rights. But for those who do engage in that kind of misconduct, if they're not held accountable, then the entire police force is tainted. And that's what's happening here without that kind of accountability. These young people were wrongly detained. There is no curfew in this town. They were not let go. Once it was clear there was no need 
to continue to question them or be there. And they were told they have no rights and there needs to be accountability. The second point I want to make is while I appreciate the council president's apology at the opening of this meeting, there's another apology that needs to come from the council president to one particular member of the community, Pat Onanabaku. And that's because during the conversation that occurred in the last meeting, who, whom I know is Mrs. Pat, uh, she made a comment in which she said that the police chief needed to think about stepping down. And the council president abruptly cut her off and as publicly reported said, quote, I think it's inappropriate for anyone to sit here and ask for a police chief's resignation in this meeting. The First Amendment prohibits any government official from engaging in viewpoint discrimination. Now, whether or not you think there are legitimate reasons for calling for the police chief's resignation, I happen to think there are. Whether or not you agree with that, it is not your place as a government official to stop that public statement from being made. Mrs. Pat's First Amendment rights were violated in that moment. It's deeply offensive to the core principles of the First Amendment that a government official would censor that kind of speech based on viewpoint discrimination. And I think an apology is owed to her as well. Thank you. Jim Oldham, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hello, um, I'm Jim Oldham. I'm, uh, I live in, at, on Columbia Drive in Amherst. And I wish to add my voice to the other strong and eloquent voices who went before me uh, to say that as a resident and a taxpayer, uh, what's done by the police in this town and by the government officials in this town does represent me and it's shaming and frankly quite horrifying to to see this behavior in our town and and as others have said better than i can right now um what happened uh, in july was such an obvious abuse of human rights that the failure of the town leadership to acknowledge that, to apologize for it, and to begin a process of retraining of those who were involved, to acknowledge that that training is needed, to acknowledge the hurt that was caused from it, the failure to do any of that is, is, is appalling, is a failure uh, to and it doesn't represent me. It doesn't represent many of us in Amherst, and it shouldn't be taking place. Uh, so I want to add my voice in support of the CSSJ committee and what they're calling for, and what um, and what others who spoke before me have called for. Every everything that you've heard, I just want to add. Thank you. Anita Sorrow. Hello, my name is Anita Saro. I'm in District 5. I've been following this quite closely and I think others both tonight and at other times have have clearly articulated what we see or the problems. My concern at present is how we move forward. Um, I This may sound a little bit like coming out of left field, but I'll share these ideas anyway. I spent all of my adult professional life in healthcare, first as a nurse and then as a lawyer who primarily worked with nurses and doctors. Some of that time was after a medical error had occurred. 
And in the early days of my practice, it was as it had been for generations. If there was a medical error, it was to run away from, it was to obfuscate, it was to circle the wagons, and it was to try to avoid any kind of responsibility. But several years ago, a different philosophy and a different model was introduced that has been adopted by a lot of hospitals, including our own local ones. And some of them use uh, the acronym CARE, C-A-R-E. CARE for communication, that there be prompt communication, immediate communication, and an identification of the problem. And A for both accountability and apology, that it is important to acknowledge and be held accountable for the errors that were made. And finally, or repair, or sometimes it's called restitution. And it was the idea of how do we compensate? How do we make this person whole to the extent that we can? First, the individual who was harmed, but as important, looking forward and doing what we used to call root cause analyses. What were the policies and procedures and expectations and practices that caused this uh, event to happen and how can we fix it? So I offer that as it is not an, you know, an exact analogy, but I think it can be helpful in thinking through those principles when going forward. Thank you. Anita, thank you for joining us. Gabrielle Davila, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, my name is Gabrielle Davila. I live in District 5. I was raised and lived in South Amherst my whole life, although I'm calling in from college today. Just to express um, what everyone else has been saying about how horrifying and disappointing this incident was, um, I think that, like everyone has said, there needs to be accountability, and we should be able to be proud of our town. When I'm in college talking about how I'm from Amherst, I want to be talking about the great colleges and the great people and the great town that I'm from. I, I don't want to be talking about how there's been a now that the members of this uh, body were told by all the residents of the town over the summer, over and over again, that there was an issue with the police department, that the police department had too much money, that the police department had not enough training. And the residents of the town were ignored. And that culminated with this. And now there needs to be action. And if you can't see that there needs to be action now, I don't know what would have to happen for you to see that there needs to be a serious fundamental change in the way that we approach policing in our town. And I think that, there, that without accountability, that those rights of everyone affected are, won't be upheld unless there is some accountability. And so if there's no accountability, then the police officer in this incident will be right. And uh, those kids won't have had any rights. So to have rights, which are an essential function in any society that claims to be a democracy in, in any good area, you need to have your rights upheld. And I, I kind of think it's, it's ridiculous that the residents of this town have to come in front of the people who claim to represent us and ask, hey, could we please have our rights upheld? And could there please be accountability for those who violate our rights? And could we please have training to make sure our rights aren't violated in the future? And I, I think that it's ridiculous that we even have to ask that. Uh, Shalini. This is a statement from Dr. Patricia Romney. She is unable to be here and she emailed me and also shared the statement as a public comment, which everyone can read. Um, so this is what she said. My review of the July 5th video showing the interaction between Amherst youth and Amherst police who were called to the scene by a noise complaint leads me to conclusion that there were errors made. 
those errors have been acknowledged by the APD. Still, the outcome was just what I would want for my children. No physical abuse, no arrests, parents called and children safely at home. It is hard for me to understand how that is not good enough. It is hard for me to understand how this can be compared to the experiences of groups like the Central Park Five who were beaten, wrongly convicted, and jailed for between six and 13 years. Our town has a DEI director, a black woman attorney with many years of experience doing work on equity and inclusion. She conducted an investigation and concluded that the police did not abuse their authority, yet her conclusions are ignored or repudiated. Who does that serve? The town council, CSJ, CSSJC, Human Rights Commission, African American Reparations Commission, the DEI officer are now all involved with the issue. I have no objection to oversight, but I wonder what community needs are not being met while much of the energy is focused on this one incident. Specifically, I would like to see us move toward the residence oversight board that has been proposed, proposed. This board will have the authority to oversee matters such as these. I have been an Amherst resident for 41 years and I'm troubled again and again and again by our community's propensity to divide into adversarial camps. The refusal to engage in dialogue focused on bridging differences in the interest of community and justice leaves everyone feeling victimized and results in little advancement towards justice and the common good. We need to do better. I'm going to return to the audience. A person with a name of Mills has their hand up. Please enter the room, state your full name and where you live. Hello? Yes. Yes, hi. Lauren Mills, 12 Long Meadow Drive, um, District 5. I would just like to read from a book that I got um, from the Jones Library. It's called Finding Her Voice. And it um, states how, well, not states, but it's about how Black girls in white spaces can speak and live their truth. And it um, talks about microaggressions and I just want to read the, the um, a, a paragraph from it. It says, microaggressions do not just hurt your feelings. They have other damaging consequences on your mental and physical health because of the ongoing stress they cause. You exert time and energy thinking about them. Therefore, it is important for you to recognize microaggressions and learn how to respond to them. Sometimes the best response is to confront the person other times it may be to get help from an adult or peer. And sometimes the best course of action is to ignore the microaggression. And a microaggression in the book says that it can be an everyday slight, put down, or an insult. Microaggressions are directed at people based on disability, gender, identity, sexual orientation, and so forth. And I, I just wanted to read that so that some of us can think about the incident and how it doesn't just, you know, affect someone if they're not physically harmed, but aggression can affect people mentally and it can be ongoing. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. The other two hands that are up are people that have already spoken. Are there any people that have not spoken that would like to speak? I'm sorry. Je sir, please come forward to the mic. Make sure you press so that the green light is on. Can you hear me all right? We can, thank you. I'm Henry Morgan. I'm a student organizer in various uh, campuses in the Pioneer Valley. I'm coming here to, uh, to address the issue that happened where the police told youths that they didn't have any rights. And in my opinion, I think that that is incredibly unacceptable because our democracy is based entirely on the civil rights of people in our communities. 
And I want to ask you guys to come here. And although we've come so far, and I know we've come so far into addressing policing, into addressing our community's need for public safety in ways that doesn't harm people with coercion or with violence, I think that we really need to think about the way that we are approaching this, to think about changing it, to think about building structures for democratic accountability to the community that is being policed, and think about, obviously, there's such an inherent need for change that this brings up. And although this is a really horrifying incident, this is also an opportunity, an opportunity for our communities to organize, an opportunity for our communities to reimagine the way that we do public safety, the way that we do policing, and the way that we do democratic accountability. And I want to encourage you guys to take this as an opportunity to build a new structure for justice and accountability. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, Athena, is there a sign-in sheet so that we can get the full name of people? No, I don't have a sign-in sheet there, no. Okay, so Sean is going to make sure that we get your full name so that we can have it for the record. Thank you very much. Um, I see two additional hands from people that have not spoken. Vera Cage, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Good evening, my name is Vera Cage and I live at 12 Long Meadow Drive, apartment 21 in Amherst. I uh, appreciate the public comments um, and the many people who have taken the time to, to witness this meeting. Um, I appreciate the town manager, Paul Balkeman, being here, being present. Um, and I recognize that there are many ways to resolve the problem that we have at hand. And I'm really hoping and yearning for our town manager's leadership in helping guide this way, because I haven't seen that guidance as of yet. Um, I'd like for him to speak more to that because I think as the town manager, um, his leadership is, is sorely needed. Um, and I'm hoping that the chair of the town council, um, President Lynn Greismark could also provide that type of leadership where the community can have some confidence in the leadership of the people elected to represent us. I would hope that people um, could provide a context to their comments. Um, I know that some of us are paid consultants to the town. Um, the previous public comment um, provided by Dr. Pat Romney um, you know, Romney Associates has been, in my experience on the school committee, was a paid consultant to the school district too, um, to provide diversity training, social justice training, um, and, and as well to, more recently, um, to provide training to the Amherst police. So I think the community needs to be aware that, of course, not everyone's going to agree with the path forward or how justice um, will be uh, had or forged. So uh, I think that at this point, the adults need to center, need to step aside and really center the experiences of the young people because every day that this drags on, that's an added injustice. Every week that goes on, every month that passes by is tormenting to the children and to the families. Please center their social and emotional well-being. Set aside your adult, your grown up, your many years on this earth and really center the experiences of these young people who haven't even found two decades on this earth. They are 15, 16, 17 year olds, okay? Please center their experiences. This is their community. This is where they go to school. This is where they reside. This is where their parents work. This is their town too, and the town needs to deliver for them. Thank you. Um, Megan Leaf. Hi, um, 
Yes, my name is Megan Leaf. Um, I'm an Amherst resident. I've lived in the town for almost 12 years. I'm um, in Precinct 1 near the North Zion Church. I don't have any official role or capacity at this moment, though I was a paraprofessional in Amherst High School for three years and did my student teaching internship for my master's degree at Amherst Middle School. So I've spent a significant amount of time working with youth in our town. Um, I don't necessarily have something unique to add on top of what's already been said. I more so just wanna echo and support existing sentiments that um, there was an injustice that was done and there are actions that should be taken. Um, specifically, I wanna support the need for an apology to these nine youths and their families, the need for APD to take accountability for what they've done, including an investigation into the incident and re records released to the public in line with what you have already been asked to do. I support the compensation fund that would be um, shaped and approved by CSSJC. Um, I support the idea of the town of Amherst having a Know Your Rights workshop for youth and other community members. And in general, I just want to say that, like, like has been said, like there could be multiple ways to pursue justice in this instance. But something that is really important and currently to me seems lacking is a sense that it's important. It's worthy of a wholehearted attention. You know, um, I wasn't at this meeting, but as I'm aware, some progress was al almost made in a previous meeting, but then it was cut short by a member of the council. And I think, um, people's confidence in this uh, elected body and in this governmental system is really impacted by how we see our fellow neighbors be treated. And so this is an opportunity for the elected officials of Amherst to step forward and show sincerity, open-heartedness, concern for the real lives of people in their town and a willingness to move beyond what your own mind might have initially felt was warranted towards what many, many people are telling you would actually achieve the goal of justice, healing, and um, yeah, just uh, healing on this incident. Thank you. Kathleen Traphagen, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm Kathleen Traphagen. I live in District 2 in Amherst. I don't have any official role. Um, I just wanted to make a point about, and this is maybe jumping the gun for the comment, the next comment period, but about the need for many voices, especially the voices of the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee and the African um, Heritage Reparations Assembly and others to weigh in with um, power and um, a voice and accountability. And the reason why I say that is I was listening to the last meeting to the chief. Um, and it really occurred to me that the police department's perception of the way that they are um, really seen in this town is really off. So he, there were two things that he said. One was, um, well, you know, or it was also in the report. Well, we, we didn't get very many official complaints from the families in this incident. There's just no perception or like understanding of the idea that these families may not feel comfortable filing an official complaint and going through that system. And so the jump that he took to, I don't have a problem here, there's no problem here, is just wrong, frankly. The other example was when he was asked, why have you not apologized? He said, well, we called up the families and invited them for pizza and they didn't want to come. So again, like, yeah, the families may not want to join you for pizza. That's not accountability. They don't feel comfortable. Do you not understand this? Like there is just an amazing lack of knowledge of the way that the police department is perceived. And I don't, I think that whatever happens next, one of the elements has got to be working with the police department so that they truly try to understand the way that young people and other, other folks see them in this town so that they don't make these conclusions which are utterly wrong about 
I don't have a problem because I got no official complaint and nobody wanted to go to pizza with me. Like that's just, as Kathleen Anderson said, insane. That's all I have right now. Thank you. There's two additional, two hands up or two or people have spoken to before. I'm going to suggest that we go on with our discussion. If you'd like to speak again at the second public comment, that there'll be an opportunity to do that at that time. Um, with that, I'm going to turn to the um, council and the CSSJC and have us begin our discussion. Dorothy. Dorothy, you're not muted. You're unmuted. I got you. I think you made a mistake in not allowing the, the two people to speak again. I think that's, you know, so you don't have to apologize again. I think just rethink that there's only two people I just think it was a mistake just to say no right now. The people that had their hand up, Gabrielle Davila is still there. Would you like to say additional comments at this point? Yes, I would. And uh, thank you to the other member of the committee for uh, bringing that up. And I, I appreciate being allowed to speak again, as I think is reasonable in this type of town hall setting. Uh, I was interested by the comment that got written in, um, referencing that, you know, this is not like the Chicago Five incident and no one was beaten and no one was put in jail for unjustly. Well, what I think is interesting is that that should not be the standard for the police in our town. The standard for the police should not be, okay, well, they didn't beat anyone and uh, no one went to jail for an extended period of time unjustly. So, you know, no problem here, no violation of rights. I mean, is that who we want to be as a town? I think Amherst should be an example for other towns, an example of greatness. Uh, right now, we look like an example of a town that doesn't know what it's doing and doesn't know how to control its own police department. And I, I think that the idea that, okay, you know, the parents were called and nobody got beat by the cops, that, that doesn't mean that nothing at all went wrong, right? And in terms of accountability, I think it's a really interesting topic to talk about, but I think my, myself, like a, a lot of other young people who are from Amherst, like we've kind of lost hope for accountability. I mean, the, the way that this town government has been run over the past couple of years, just does not give me a lot of hope, um, particularly with this group of elected officials, that anything is going to change. And I really don't think that's the message we want to send to young people such as myself, a message of, uh, well, you know, we didn't beat you, so don't complain. Um, and we offered you pizza and you, you didn't want to take it. So that means that, you know, your rights must not have been violated. I mean, that's just not how things should work. Um, and, and so I, I think that the, this we need to, as a town, to have more examples for the positive. We need to, this is an opportunity to show the young people of the town such as myself, that you, the town government, do actually care, that you actually will do something, not pizza, but a structural change. And that's what needs to happen. And so I, I think that, you know, we, we, the young people, we want to see big things, right? We, we don't want to see some like, what are we asking for right now? We're asking for an apology. Like, yeah, an apology would be nice, but when someone's rights are violated and when someone is told you have no rights, the solution is not an apology that, that we're being forced to come to this meeting and beg for. Like the solution is a change in the police contract. And to be honest, I think the solution is a change in the elected officials that have really shown no regard to the wants and needs of young people such as myself. I mean, how can you expect us to think that you're going to seriously hold the police accountable when you wouldn't reduce their budget? And I mean, right, right now, based on what I just heard, there's not even a sign-in sheet at the town meeting. So yeah, like young people such as myself have a very low amount of expectations for this body. And I want this to be an opportunity for the town of Amherst to show young people like myself that you are actually going to do something. Kathleen Anderson, you were the other person with your hand up. Yeah. 
Did you want to re-enter the room? Okay, I just, at this point, I just want to um, support the, and, uh, the last two commenters because they're essentially going to say what I wanted to say. In addition, the I'm one of the co-founders of the Study Circle's Dialogues on Race and Class. For four years, we engaged with over 350 town members in dialogues around race and class. Currently, there is the um, Jewish community that is doing the stolen beam conversation. And I just recommend that all of the particularly white people in this town and in on these committees that are represented here tonight, that you participate in those um, conversations. Um, it would, should be a useful tool for you to um, look at yourselves and, and your own behaviors around race and class. And, um, and perhaps that will uh, create the kind of change that the, particularly the last two and Vera um, Cage, uh, Kathleen Traphagen, and I'm sorry, but I can't remember the name of the young man who just spoke. But it's time that uh, we become a town that is an example of anti-bias, anti-racism, not a continuation of that. Thank you. Martha Hanner, you've raised your hand. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Uh, thank you. It's Martha Hanner for District 5. Uh, may I just ask Athena to tell us how many attendees are listening tonight? There are 75 attendees in the audience and 24 panelists in the room. Thank you. I think that shows that there is a, a concern here in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Are there any other comments? All right, then we're going to people who have their hands raised that are in the room and we will come back to public comment once we are into the action items. Deborah Ferrara. I think that the, um, uh, Allegra, you may have been before me. Did you want to go? Or do you want me to go? Um, you can go. And I think Dee and I had some kind of remarks that we wanted to share. Um, okay. So, yeah. So for me, I mean, you know, I'm here sitting in a car waiting for my son to come out of practice, you know. Um, and, you know, I'm just really frustrated because we're here again, we're here talking about this issue. I don't know why it, it's just so difficult um, to really get to the, to the point of the police taking accountability for what transpired, town manager coming out and saying, taking accountability, um, you know, the compensation fund being put in place for the families and the young people um, for uh, an apology to be made. I mean, Lynn, I have to use you as an example when Miss Pat, ask for, for the chief's resignation, you were quick to say that that was incorrect. You know, so why is it that we're months down the line and this has not happened? And I'm sitting in a car more hours doing the same thing. And then you had the last counselor try to shut down conversation. I mean, you know, we, we want this to happen. I want to know whether, whether an action is going to take, what's going to happen today that's going to start addressing these issues so that we can get to the healing. The healing is not going to happen unless accountability takes place. And we keep on, you know, as, as uh, one of the commenters, Vera said, this is traumatizing to the young people. The more time we continue to elongate this, right, and continue to, to, to drag this forward without, you know, taking full accountability and, and, and moving this along, you know, this is what we're, we're going to continue to do. I'm going to have to continue to, you know, take time away from everything to, to hear, you know, this type of trauma, this type of anger, this type of, you know, we need to get to the point of action, right? So for me today, I'm hoping that there will be action and not action like those two reports that, that transpired last time at the last meeting that were full of holes yet again, no, all generalities, 
no details, no answering of any questions. That's why I had a gazillion questions, right? That only some of them were answered by the chief. I mean, nothing. I'm just kind of like, you know, you can't write, right? And you all wrote this. When I was on CSWG, you, you all created this because you, you wrote this whole statement about being anti-racist, right? In an inclusive town. You can't write empty words like that, right? And then when an incident happens, then you, you're not able to stand by those words. We're going to hold you all to those words. We're going to hold the town and the councils and, and the town manager and everyone else accountable to write that you don't write anti-racist and then proceed along in other ways and not walk that walk. So for me, I want to know, right, are we going to get to do what we need to do today and start really giving th these families and these young people, you know, what, what they need, which is you do have rights. You, you, you are cared for. We care for you in this town and, and, and we're going to show that. Because, you know, like I said, Lynn, you were quick to, to try to admonish Ms. Pat. So why can't we be quick about doing what we need to do for these families? Allegra? Um, I wanted to take a minute to thank everybody who's in the audience, everybody who has given public comment so far, and to thank Deborah um, for her comments. I know that our last meeting ended pretty contentiously. And, you know, I, I agree with what Rodney Parker said, you know, it's modeling the behavior of apologizing, hopefully, hopefully, A, that can help this conversation tonight go forward. And hopefully that will bring some resolutions forward so that we can have action on, on the things that we've been asking for. Um, and so I know that specific to the motion tonight is a concern around the July 5th incident. Um, and there are three specific things that the CSSJC had asked for in regards to that, um, one being the victim compensations fund, one being accountability through releasing any investigative reporting, and one being an apology. Um, and I think the previous speakers were absolutely right that demanding, you know, inviting somebody for pizza so that you can apologize and then not apologizing because you didn't have pizza doesn't make much sense. Um, I just, I wanted to share that there are additional demands that CSSJC had put forward back in July. And those are more related to the structure and practice of policing as a whole and you know, not just related to this July 5th incident, but to everything that goes on with the police department in this town from now until whenever. Um, and I think that this conversation needs to remain fresh because there was an incident on the Hampshire College campus on October 19th, and a letter went out to the entire Hampshire staff, students, and faculty regarding Amherst police coming onto campus, detaining a student, and I'm just going to read a few excerpts. And the student was not engaged in dangerous behavior and was entirely compliant with the directives of officers. Despite posing no threat to the officers, they placed the student in forcible restraints before questioning them. Hampshire College objects to this treatment, and it should not have happened. President Weyenbach spoke with both the Amherst Town Manager and Chief of Police to express our concerns and objections about the decisions that were made in this situation. Um, Amherst Police is a community response and when utilized by our campus will follow its own protocols and procedures. If you find yourself in a difficult but non-life-threatening situation, please call campus safety and well-being before using 911 or contacting local police. So the Dean of Students of one of our universities sent a letter to everybody saying, please don't call the police to our campus. That's very concerning. And I just want to end my remarks by saying that the remaining asks that we had put forward in July are to freeze all Amherst Police Department hiring, including any vacant positions until CRESS has been operational for at least six months to determine whether CRESS would be a more appropriate way to resource the community, engage the community envisioning sessions to help seal, heal from systemic and structural inequities, create the resident oversight board to increase police accountability in the community, establish protocols and use the Crest Department in all nonviolent community calls, 
eliminate pretext stops, cons consent searches, and sector-based community policing to reduce the opportunities for contact between the police and BIPOC drivers and create a youth empowerment center for BIPOC and all youth under the DEI department to provide positive opportunities for youth in the community. And those are all, again, taken from the community safety working groups recommendations, but we are still upholding those asks. Thank you. Thank you, Lego. Uh, D. Yes, um, thank you. And thank you for people in the community being engaged and concerned. Um, thank you to the youth that are showing their support and really trying to have this community win. They want us to win, they want us to be better, but they want accountability. And we really need to listen to that. Um, I know the letters of William Stewart of Leverett are in the packet, but I just want us to um, kind of highlight some of the things Mr. Stewart uh, brought to bear on his letter to both the town council and to DEI. Um, he says the July 5th police and youth interaction, I'm not a resident of Amherst, but my family's part of Amherst Regional Public School community. And I was one of two adults. So here's, here's a witness at the scene that evening. So the letter he wrote to uh, DEI Director Nolan Young, he outlines five different types of discrimination. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but the ones that I think are particularly unsettling that he witnessed. He says um, the third type of discrimination was language-based. Neither officer spoke Spanish and they were ignoring the mother of one of the youths who was present, who had offered to drive the youths home. It was not until I arrived, and he identifies himself as English-speaking white male, an English-speaking white man that the officer's uh, tenor changed and the detention of the youth ended. The fourth was race-based discrimination. Six of the nine youths were Black, Indigenous, or people of color. None of the nine have said they feel safe coming forward to tell their side of the story for fear of retaliation, including his own child. The fifth type of discrimination was evident in the way the officers explained their behavior to me. So they began commiserating with the white man. They told me the youth were being detained because they could have been anybody, even college students. Then they tried to commiserate with me about how much trouble college students make and how many noise complaints they are responsible for. It was as if we would share a common bond of animosity towards college students and that this treatment of local youth was justified unless they could prove they were not in college. He ends with the police, uh, they abused uh, their authority um, and that they need to take responsibility. So I urge folks, if you have not seen that letter to read through it, but it just drives the point home about these young people were traumatized. And I just want us to, to you know, in light of what's been shared uh, through the letter that was read um, by town councilor Shalini, Trauma is the lasting emotional response that often results from living through a distressing event. Experiencing a traumatic event can harm a person's sense of safety, sense of self, and ability to regulate emotions and navigate relationships. So this is long-term effects of trauma. So we're coming up on November 5th, four months since the July incident, concerning what you all have charged us to do, that is, this is clearly not what, what we were supposed to be doing, right? Indeed, this whole exercise could be seen as a waste of time if there is no commitment to change, to look at the policing practices, and to change the culture of this town government. These young people may be still processing this event, and in terms of trauma, it is according to an author on the subject, Kiara Amani, trauma is an experience that negatively impacts how we see God, God, ourselves, or others. 
the youth, particularly the African heritage youth in the July 5th incident exist in a world of racial trauma already. And then there's this event where they are detained, identified, sat on a curb, told that they have no rights. What do we know about the trauma this added to their lives? And how dare we presume that uh, some of the adults saying this is a non-incident? A 2020 study found that 44% of the Black participants reported symptoms uh, persistent with depression and anxiety. Only one in three Black Americans in need of mental health care receives treatment, okay? So when we talk about trauma, we're already existing in trauma, and this is on top of that. So this protracted process amounts to a diversion of the real work concerning equity, the APD, and the town manager. It really is. We are here tonight however, to support the repair and a process of resolution because it's emblematic of the work we have taken on the CSSJC regarding community safety and moving the community towards equity. Chief Livingstone has already spoken with us a couple of times and he may truly believe his narrative, but it does not comport with the video, what the parents, William Stewart has shared with us, and more importantly, what the young people uh, have shared about July 5th. The chief's narrative reflects his support of his officers, and that is in part why we are here in this moment. He has expressed some regret over the erroneous statement of, of the officer, but that does not amount to an apology that recognizes what took place, what was wrong, and the recognition of harm to the youth and their families. And now, as this drags on, the harm to this community, the harm to this community. All we have heard besides admitting an erroneous statement is that of speculation. Had they left the young people alone, we would have had a larger problem. The chief may believe this narrative, but other facts have emerged that express a different version of events. And I'm ending here. What we do, what we do know is that recent reports from DEI and APD neglect to include the perspectives and realities of the young people. That's not personal. That's just a fact. A representative from the CSSJC appointed as a spokesperson and authorized to speak on behalf of the families to the town manager and APD, Ms. Pat has not been invited to meet to this date with the DEI and the town manager or APD to talk directly. The town may feel that they can ignore this trusted member of our community, but again, it's ignoring the wishes of the families. In the end, we all want a speedy resolution and repair that centers the young people and their families and want the town manager or town council president to explain why that is not possible and why it's not happening. Thank you. We're continuing the discussion at this time. Are there any other comments from counselors or members of the CSSJC? Mandy Jo. Um, if Ms. Pat would like to speak first, she may. Ms. Pat. Thank you. Good evening, all. I want to thank all the people in the audience that spoke tonight in support of the MS9 and CSSJC and speaking truth to the power. I had planned to say something different tonight, but I'm going to uh, switch. I think what I've experienced, which is not unusual um, for, for Black women or for Blacks, is invisibility. I run a company. And as a CEO, if that is a problem, I'll be responsible to make sure that it's fixed. Image is everything. Our town is a, it's sort of a corporation. Our town manager is the CEO and the town council is sort of board of directors. There was an incident on July 5th and it came to light and there was inaction. In fact, part of the, uh, issue was that is a third party, a spokesperson for the group, and it was ignored. 
Why? Because black people don't count. If I were a white person, it would be different. And what I've been saying along has been validated by a white parent from Leverett, because I knew the story already. The, 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 the youth shared everything. And I stated it at CSHS meeting. I said that some of them at the town council joint meeting that we had, but nobody believed me. I was being, I was being uh, ignored, of course. And I, people who know me that I don't care for anyone. I do what is right to the best of my knowledge. History will judge who is doing good to move this town forward. And the last thing I will say is that people have different positions about this incident and I respect all diverse opinion, but I urge everyone to follow the money in this town, to follow the money in this town. That's where people you know, stand. If you're employed by this town, of course you, you, know, you will support the police. If you want to win a ne the next election, of course you, you know, support the police. If you have contract with the town or you do training with, to the police or school committee, of course you will support the, the police. If you are friends or involved with business uh, at BID, of course you will support the police. So the point of it is follow the money and see where people stand. And for me, I want action. I want action. I think our town have let our youth down. Our town manager have not shown leadership. Our, our uh, police chief really, really needs to step down. That's the only way we can have reconciliation in this town. Without that, it's not going to happen. He has not shown leadership at APD. He has continuously defended his staff and has attacked the youth, basically, and ignored. And I'm hoping that tonight there will be action, and not just for us, for this to be another show. Why is this so difficult to make decision? For somebody to make apology? Is it very difficult for white middle class to make apology? Is that a culture thing? Why is it difficult to settle, uh, to do uh, uh, compensation? It gets done at special education. People uh, settle uh, 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 agreement all the time. Why is this different? Why is it difficult to you know, produce a comprehensive report? Because the APD are used to lack of tra transparency in this town. And I will stop and see how all this goes, but we're not going to stop that I've been silenced when I tried to say for the chief police to, to step down, I will not you know, be silenced. I will continue to push it. And there is people in the community who wants the police chief to step down. That's the only way we can have reconciliation because in some segment of our town, no longer have confidence in this guy. He needs to go. He doesn't live in this town. He has no, no investment in our town. He needs to move on. Thank you. Mandy Joe. I think this is our third meeting discussing this incident. And it's really the first one that I've gotten an idea of what's being asked of the council. Um, that could be my own fault. I'm not gonna fault anyone else. Um, but I have struggled with what as a council, a legislative body we're being asked to do. So I wanna say thank you to um, some of the CSSJC members that just spoke to be clarifying what they're asking at least the town to do. I'm still not sure where the council falls in this. Um, and what I heard was they would like a concrete apology from at a minimum the chief um, and the town manager for the statements that were made by the police officer, that they want accountability through the release of an investigative report and that they're formally asking for a victim's compensation fund to be formed and for 
the nine youths involved in this to be compensated for harm. I think that begins and allows us to begin a discussion now that we know what's being asked. Um, and it's probably a bit late for us to have finally figured that out or for me to have finally figured that out. Um, I probably should have figured that out months ago, um, but I've struggled with as a legislative body, what can the council do? Um, we are not the CEO, as Ms. Pat said, that's the town manager. We um, hire and review the town manager, not the police department. Um, and accountability, we've had investigative reports published. It's clear that there is a difference of opinion in this town as to whether those are sufficient or not. Um, I'm not sure how we get to a resolution on that in my mind, um, because some of the parts of the incident probably need to remain private. Um, and, you know, there's privacy laws involved. There's other things involved in terms of seeking accountability for officers who made a mistake in the words they used. Um, personnel records are private and I'm not personally willing to challenge that. I don't think we can challenge that. That's, that's what our state law says. Um, you know, I think, but we can begin a conversation now with some of these things. I know I'm running out of town because we time because we get three minutes, but I just wanted to say conversation is hard. Um, but when we have an idea of what is being asked of us, we can at least begin that conversation. So I'm hoping we as a council can take those three actions and begin discussing them. I would also like to add to that one thing that I've been thinking of is how do we get, how do we have a conversation around procedural change on the police department um, in procedures, but also a conversation on response to noise bylaws. And I will expand on that potentially a little later because there's been conflict amongst residents as to how this town should respond to noise bylaws, complaints, and calls. Kathy? Um, as I, as Do you as need I to press the button? Know, uh, is, am I on now? Yeah. The green light's on. Just speak into the microphone, It's please. in my mouth. <laughs> okay. It is touching my lips. Is it my mic? <laughs> Is this better? Oh, much better. Much better. Thank you. I don't have to inhale it, which is excellent. Um, as people know, I missed uh, the last meeting. Um, I did have the chance to watch it. Uh, I missed it partly because it was one o'clock in the morning where I was, and I would have really been dysfunctional. I, I want to just start by saying Lynn starting the meeting today with an apology was to me such a breath of fresh air. Um, another, one of our public comments talked about medical errors and what we're taught. And I, for about 20 plus years, worked in the medical world on policies. New Zealand had a no-fault policy on medical errors, which the most important thing was using teachable moments, um, trying to identify the error, and apologizing. So I think we are talking about sincere apologies, not just a we made a few uh, wrong statements. The other, for me, one of the teachable moments I had from years in labor and management conflict where I was on the weaker side of a minority labor union was to think before I spoke and to be really careful about the words I used. And I think that's a teachable moment for our police department as well. Um, you know, uh, what you say matters and the tone you use matters. So I, I want to leave time, um, most of the time tonight, to talk about what actions we can take. Um, I believe strongly that we can approach the concerns that have been raised and potential areas of conflict if we have a spirit of helpfulness 
and we can look at ways to improve the way the clown governs and functions and learn to apologize. We can achieve the goals if we feel welcome, valued, and safe. And that means counselors as well. We, we have to be able to make mistakes. And I just wanna make sure everyone reminds ourselves, we have taken major actions and put ourselves on the map. We've invested over a million dollars in an alternative to the police force. We've hired them in record time. They're getting trained. And I think in the future, once they're ready, we can be thinking of peak load, evening holiday responses where they might be part of the group or a team that goes out on noise complaints. This was all started with a resident calling the police. And I live in a district where people are begging the police to come out on noise complaints because of, of what happens and wishing they would respond more and that we've assigned them that responsibility. So we put a million dollars into CRESS and I think we will be a model for the state and for the country. And it's exciting. We have an incredibly skilled DEI director. And when we say leadership from the town manager, he was able to go out and find us a terrific hire. And we need to give her a lot of support um, and time because she's jumping in and July 5th, yes, she had to jump right in. And we need to be there for her as uh, she works with Paul, for Paul, and she's working in teamwork. So I'm going to end my comments right then, because I think before us, we have a series of motions that are actions and they're follow up actions. But I really want to remind people how remarkable the council has been. We have also set up, I forgot, and Michelle will be the first to remind me, we've set up a reparations fund that is building a long term endowment. Again, we are one of the few communities that done that. So it's not that we have just been talking. We have been looking for ways to act. And I I think we can build on these and I think we can come uh, several of the motions tonight I would strongly support not all of them and I don't know how Lynn plans on handling it which is why I having a menu like this for me is sheer delight and I just want to assure everybody in this audience that's not normally in the council how often Lynn cuts me off so it's not um, because I talk too long so I'm going to stop right now so I can come back when we get to the actions. It's one of my most unpleasant jobs. Um, Jennifer. Uh, thank you. Um, so I, I guess picking up on what Kathy said and you know, um, also responding to the speakers and, and Ms. Pat, I was, um, you know, it kind of brings us to the motion because I think the motion that's I, I'm, this may not be the time to get into a discussion of the motion, but I do think that Councillor Miller's amended motion would do a lot to, you know, begin the repair. And what I, among them, we'll discuss the motion later, but among the many amendments to your motion that I really appreciated and I think is extremely important is that we establish a consensus on the factual record of what transpired during the incident on July 5th. And we also establish a, connect, a consensus on the factual record of the follow-up to that, to that incident. Because when I, it was always my sense that we were not getting, we the counselors and the public were not getting the full picture of what transpired on July 5th. And when the letter came from Mr. Stewart, I, I realized he wasn't there for the in, entire you know, incident, but he was there for maybe 40 minutes and it was like the missing piece. And I am struggling with why that wasn't included, particularly in the addendum we received to the reports at the last meeting. Um, and I should have appreciated it from the very, I did, but I'm even more so appreciated the, the trauma that was involved, if in fact, not if, I mean, what, it, that, that there wasn't a group of nine until they were rounded up together and that some of the youth were just at a, you know, at a, so one of, at somebody's house and they, you know, heard something outside, they went outside and then they were rounded up and I can't, you know, imagine how, how that must've felt. So it was, um, so I, 
am cons I feel badly. I am struggling with that we didn't respond in the way we would have had we had that information sooner. And so I think it's very important that we do reach some shared consensus on what happened that evening and, and then on the follow-up. And when you bring that together with what happened at Hampshire College, which we just learned about this past weekend, it does um, you know, beg the question of that do that the police that protocols have to be looked at because we have been told that responses to both incidents, the department was following protocol. So maybe the protocols need to, some of the protocols need to be revisited because it seems like there's an airing, not on restraint, but on maybe being, you know, overly aggressive. And that is a is a concern. I don't want to digress into what happened at Hampshire College, but that was also a very concerning incident. Um, and, you know, it hurt me that the Dean of Students felt that they needed to instruct the community, you know, to contact the town and our police department as a, as a last resort. So um, I know we'll be discussing the motions in more detail, but I do think at least one of the motions is broad enough and specific enough to get to get us on the path to repair, and I hope that we can we can we can um, vote to approve a, a step going forward that will begin to get us to healing because we we do have a lot of work to do. Thank you. I I just want to remind people we are not discussing the motions at this time. Okay, Pam. Thank you. Um, I, I think we all want to believe that Amherst treats everyone equally and, and um, that our police force is well trained to anticipate mixed ages, mixed backgrounds in its day to day work. Um, and that they and they do it reasonably reasonably well. But, you know, hearing the stories uh, and seeing almost firsthand with father's letters and, and memos from Miss um, Pat that um, the, 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 it, we, we sort of learn how the youth were treated. Uh, it really opens our eyes to uh, the fact that bias does exist. I want to acknowledge that. And that the heavy handedness of this particular incident could have been a very different outcome. It could have been a very positive and healthy one and helpful one. Um, for the driver with the flat tire or the friends who hung out, hung out with him. Their experience as they were handled by the police, in fact, unfortunately reinforced the bias and the discrimination. And I'm, and I'm really, really sad about that. I would like as an action item to, to have the police department acknowledge and, and apologize that the actions affected those youth. Acknowledge it, it did affect them. I want the, the Amherst Police Department to update its policy on how to, how to work with youth, all without, I'm sure, jeopardizing its stature, its presence, and its purpose at, on other calls across the, across the year and with other entities. Um, I think it can do it without the expense of, of somehow losing face in the community. Um, I also support very strongly the creation of the, the resident oversight board and that needs and needed to have happened already. Those are my two action items. And I would look forward to motions to move this thing for conclusion. Thank you. Alicia. Um, thank you. Um, so I have a lot that I want to say, and I'm not going to say everything that I want to say right now, because some of them, some of it is more pertaining to other portions of the meeting, partially that, and partially because this is a very difficult conversation and I'm feeling like very emotional right now. Um, and one of the things that's like, one of the emotions that I'm really strongly feeling is anger, to be very honest, um, and that is because I worked for a year and was barely compensated for my time, as did many other people on this meeting right now. 
to try to tell you these things. So for the response to be, I'm just now understanding what you're asking from us when there is a whole written report from over a year ago and a whole matrix that we created as a council with concrete steps that we could have taken earlier to hopefully prevent things like this from happening makes me very upset and very frustrated. Um, and I'm upset and frustrated because like it affects me, but also because it affects so many people in this community. And I think this conversation really, really fails to honor perspective. Like we all have our own perspectives. We're all entitled to our own perspectives. But when you're trying to think about and deal with a conversation that is coming from the perspective of someone else, that is where I think we do not succeed as a town because you can't understand people if you don't believe them. And we don't believe people who have different perspectives than we do. This incident is very concerning. I have lived in this town for my entire life. There are a lot of people on this meeting who have not lived here in their entire lives, who did not grow up here as a person of color, as a low income person of color. And now as a parent of children of color going to school here. I have seen this happen so many times. This is not the first time. And that is why the CSWG was created and we came up with all these things and we talked to other people. This is not a, like, a unique experience of some people. And that is why we can't just say like, oh yes, we are only going to address this incident. Yes, we need to address this incident. And we need to make like real changes because these things will continue to happen. And they have been happening before this. Just because we don't believe people, because it wasn't caught on video, does not mean it wasn't happening. I care about the people in this town. Like the black men and the black women in this town are my friends and my family. This happens too much. We don't need to have this conversation anymore. We just need to do something. Shalini. Um. I'm so sorry, Alicia. I'm so sorry to all the people who suffer in this town because of their color. My son is a person of color and he's been called Osama bin Laden, go back home. So I know not the same way that you know, but I know what it means to be a person of color in this community. And I also know that all the counselors sitting here I also know that the members of the CSSJC who have been working so hard sitting out in the car in the dark and the cold and their committee before that, the CSWG, that worked so hard. I believe in the people. I believe in our town, even though we're making mistakes. I know we're nowhere close to where we want to be, um, but I do know that we we heard you when 100 people came here and shared the experiences of living in fear in this community. We heard you, which is why we supported the creation of the Community uh, Responders Program. We heard you when the Reparations Fund was proposed. I was one of the sponsors of that when the whole nation is debating whether we should have reparations or not, our town supported it. We supported the DEI department based on the recommendations of the CSWG. And we are so fortunate because every department, every school is looking for a DEI director right now. And we were so fortunate to have Ms. Pamela Young to lead our department. Moving forward, I, you know, what we don't have right now, 
when we're talking about accountability, we're talking about process, we don't have that in place right now. And what we do need desperately, and based on the safety, um, the community safety working groups proposal recommendation was the creation of a residence oversight board. So we have started working on the CRES, on the DEI and the department. But one of the first things that the DEI director was supposed to do is the creation of a residence oversight board that will take care of these and will look into these problems um, in the future. So I really feel that all of us need to do everything we can to support the creation of the residence oversight board. And I will speak more when we speak to the motions. Dorothy. Okay. I agree that it is a good thing, the work we've been doing, the new committees that we have formed and the new departments we have formed and the people who've been able to speak and to try to reach us through those new committees. But the thing I want to say now is that there, it's a very grave mistake to underestimate the effect of trauma and anxiety, because I feel that that's what's been happening all this time. You've had parents and people from the BIPOC community telling you that the youth are really traumatized and other people saying, why? What's the problem? It turned out okay, didn't it? And I just have to relate it to an experience of mine, which does not have to do with race because I'm a white person. But years ago, I was a victim of an attempted rape in the bathroom at the school where I was teaching in the South Bronx. And it was stopped by some students who came in and stopped it. So at some point, somebody said, so what's the problem? Nothing happened. Well, I'll tell you, that was 40 years ago. Was it 50 years ago? I don't know how many years it's ago, but I cannot enter a public bathroom without that anxiety overcoming me. And I have to look under the, uh, the, the, every door to see if there are any feet and anyone hiding in there. Trauma doesn't go away. The fact that I continue to live a life where I can go out in public and overcome it and the kids are able to get up and go to school and function doesn't mean that their trauma is nothing and it's not important. It is very important and I'm very upset about it and it has not been treated well by this town. It has been minimized and people have just really not believed others when they say it's real. And I do thank Mr. William Stewart his letter was great. I want to know why it wasn't revealed to us. It was sent to the DEI office a long time ago, and I didn't get it till recently. I, I don't feel that we have really been dealing with openness. I think we need to be more open, and I think there has to be accountability, and I think that we have to stop thinking that if we just follow little rules and do the meeting the right way, somehow it'll go away, because the problem's not going to go away. It's not going to go away unless we do something positive about it. And we have to treat the anxiety and the trauma of the young people seriously. They feel that all the lessons they were told about behave well, speak respectfully, the police are your friend, they're not going to get you if you don't do anything stupid and silly. They've kind of lost some trust. I hope they can regain their trust. But it should not be underestimated that something very bad happened here and it's been ignored. And I would like to hear some of the leadership of the town speak strongly about that. Thank you. Mandy Cho. I don't know. I'm not sure anyone on the council has questioned whether the youth are harmed. Um, I know I've accepted that they say they're harmed and I'm not going to question and say that, well, from my perspective, they haven't been. They've said they're harmed. I'm going to accept that they've been harmed. I think where I struggle is whose responsibility is it to repair the harm? And it's hard to speak in public because we don't always say the right words and what we're thinking. So I'm hoping I'm not being taken um, with the wrong meaning, but part of what the CSWG said when they were doing their report is basically, in my understanding, that basically every police interaction causes harm. 
whether that's with a white person, with a black person, there are differing degrees of harm, but every interaction does because sadly, you know, that's sort of how it's designed in a sense is it creates an emotional harm. Um, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what the outcome's going to be. You may or may not have been breaking a rule. You may or may not get a ticket. If you end up not getting a ticket, you've still gone through that experience that probably has emotional harm. Um, where I struggle with the repair question is, does every interaction result in a harm that, is there a different type of harm that should result in some sort of compensation that I'm hearing requested from, the count, from, from members of this community? Or is the harm that was suffered the same harm basically that is suffered by anyone who has the cops called on them? because we have to remember that there was a 911 call and that the police department responded to that 911 call. Um, and so that's part of where I struggle with some of the requests and some of what our responsibility is, is because when I look at our town and we have a lot of, and I'm just gonna take noise complaints. We have a lot of noise complaints called into this town. And I, can accept that the, the people who are on the receiving end of those noise complaints, the ones that are at the property when the police show up, have harm. They have emotional distress when the police show up. But does that automatically, should that automatically result in compensation for repair? And that's where I'm struggling and where I don't know what the answer is, and I don't know how to deal with that and whether this incident outside of the comment that was, as everyone has admitted, erroneous, and the comment about no rights was absolutely erroneous. I don't know whether that rises to a level of harm that is different from harm that is experienced by anyone who has had the cops called on them in this town. And so I just struggle with that. And I don't know what the right answer is. I don't know what the right response is. And that's what I'm trying to work through. Breaking. Um. Part of the reticence that I seem to observe with this um, committee and with the town in general comes because we will end up using words that could be misinterpreted. And that seems to be a trend um, that I've seen um, this evening. Um, the incident itself played out because words were used in an improper way and I think we run the risk um, of also um, adding to words being used wrongly. And I would suggest good for members of um, this August body and for the public to be careful with the words that we use in the sense that words that we use should bring people together rather than tear them um, apart. I think one of the few things that I would just like to point out is we might use the word accountability, but if we have multiple accounts, then what is accountable? We may be looking to have action for this event that took place, but the fact remains that whatever we do in this particular instance is going to be the benchmark for what comes next. Therefore, it's important to find out what happened this time so that we can actually learn from the experience. It is not enough, I would say, to appease a chorus simply to act. We need to know before acting. And so when we act, we can build this better future that we want for the town. And I'd like to end by 
saying that one of the reasons I joined the um, committee is I have been teaching and I've been teaching political science and I wanted to know how government works. And this has been um, an educational experience that can be taught in the four walls of a classroom. And for that, I am appreciative, but I would hasten to caution us that by our words, we don't undermine the system of government that we have. What do I mean by this? What I mean is we have a representative system and sometimes we need to, as representatives, act and deliberate in a way that would be a reflection for how we want deliberation to happen in public. What we had last month wasn't the proper way to deliberate. And I'm hoping that as we move forward, we put ourselves out there as examples for how we can de deliberate properly and push forward with building Amherst in a better way. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Deborah? Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess I wanted to address some of what um, Councilor Mandy Joe um, asked in terms of harm. Um, I think again, like Alicia was saying earlier, you know, we at uh, the uh, CSWG, we hired seventh gen and we shared accounts, right? They went into the community, they spoke with a variety of different people, uh, you know, different languages, um, cultures, ethnicities, all of whom said that the, the way that they um, were treated or mistreated by the police where it's very much, you know, the harm that occurs, right? So in terms of when you're dealing, and so I'm a council manager, when, you're de when the police are dealing with, and we talked about, right, the, the creation of the police as, as paddies that used to chase down African slaves, right, from back then, and that was the inception of the police, right? And a lot of the, uh, of the philosophy of the police has been drawn from that history. And we talked about how in this, in this over and over again, people shared, people also contacted during uh, all the town meetings that we had at CSWG, people of color, BIPOC people talking about the interactions. Me as a black woman, right? If I have a flat tire, if I have anything, my first thought is not to call the police, is not to call the police for help. I am, I am nervous because I, I know that as a black woman, the, the police will not see me as someone that they're gonna help. They'll probably, they'll see me as a criminal. That is the difference between, you know, when the police showed up there with, uh, uh, you know, young people, well, one is the treatment of young people and also being uh, BIPOC, right? Is how they related to that group, right? Which it, instead of it being something of, helping, it was more so of shutting down and intimidating. And if you go and you ask BIPOC people <laughs> over and over again, and we showcased that over a year, their interactions with the police, by and large, 99% out of the time is negative. It's not showing up to a help and to, uh, to assist. There were even incidences of them saying like, I asked the police for help, and instead of them helping me, they're questioning me as I'm the one that, that was, was, was creating the problem. So I, I don't know what it is that we have to do <laughs> as black people, as you know, BIPOC people in this community in Amherst to showcase, right? Do we have to, I guess, right? Do we have to get beat up, beat down? You know what I'm saying? Like end up in the hospital or God forg forgive someone dead? For that to, to happen, to showcase that, that's what we're trying to prevent. That's what we're trying to tell you all, to send this strong message and to act now, as opposed to having us, right, you know, continue to re-traumatize us by saying, prove, prove the harm, BIPOC people, prove it. We don't believe you over and over and over and over again. I'm just like, I just don't get it. I have two, you know, my, my son, black kids. I'm trying to protect them from what could 
could obviously happen to them in this town as being black boys and black men who, who is 18. My oldest is 18, soon to be 19. And what could happen to him? I don't need to continue to prove it to you all. We've shown the data, we've shown you, we've, we've, we've interviewed people, we've shown you all the harm, we're telling you the harm. Why is it again that you all do not believe us? Time for action. Stop asking us to prove it. Allegra. Um, I just wanted to kind of draw. Allegra, we can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, not very well. No. How about now? We can hear you better. We're sorry we can't see your face, but oh. um, I'll try this and let me know if it doesn't work. Um, so better. I just wanted to draw maybe a comparison to the recovery community. And you might have heard that in Alcoholics Anonymous, if people are doing step work and they get to the ninth step, they're supposed to make amends to people who they have harmed. And they talk about direct amends. So that might be an apology directly to somebody who they have harmed for the specific behavior. And they talk about a living amends, which is changing the way that you are or changing the way that your behavior always will be to make sure that the harm never happens again. So I think kind of to Mandy Joe's point of how do we know when which harm is you know deserving enough of repair, I think the answer is all of them. And whether that repair is just a direct apology or direct you know compensation through a justice compensation fund if one is established, we also have to think about the, the living repairs or the, the ongoing changing of the system so that the harms aren't revisited to that person again. So that's where the CSWG's other recommendations come into place by reducing the size and scope of the Amherst Police Department so that there's less opportunity for the BIPOC residents to come into contact with the police department and especially in you know i think one of the biggest examples given was in traffic stops so we're not doing consent searches we're not doing you know we're not pulling people over on a on a whim and then making up a reason for for why you know pretext stops is what it's really called um we're putting these alternatives in place so that we're providing supportive services to the community so that there's not going to be the interaction with the police in the first place. That is another way to reduce the harm. And you know, I, I hope that that comparison is helpful and accurate um, to what the CSWG's intentions were, but that's, that's kind of a way that I've conceptualized it in my own thinking about it and the proactive safety model that I think the CSWG put forward and the CSSJC is continuing to ask for. Thank you. Allegra, I just want to mention that your sound was fine once you got into it or did some final adjustment. And so if you would like to turn your camera back on, I think it would be fine. Okay. Yeah. Shalini? Yes, I'm still hearing the same um, sense of urgency that we need a process to determine the harm caused and um, and what how that can be, uh, what is the re reconciliation process for that. Uh, but I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the context of this specific thing. So there are two separate things, I believe. One is that we all agree that we need a process, we need a residence oversight board, including the police. The police are also supporting the creation of a residence oversight board. They've supported the, the community responders. So we're all on board with all of these um, recommendations. So, but aside from that, 
Um, and then that's because we're responding to the urgency. We know we want the change, right? The second thing is this specific incident. And I, I feel that um, since we were only given a 53 second video, no one came forward with a longer video. So the context is, it was mentioned in uh, the DEI director's report, and I believe it was in the police, but I missed it. And I believe many people have missed the context within which the statement was made by the police. And I just want to highlight that. So in the starting of the video, the police is saying, dude, I don't need to hear that you have your rights. And that statement was made in the context, in a particular context. And I want to restate that. The context was that the police were called for a noise complaint. The protocol when there's a violation of a noise bylaw is that the police comes, they did not have their sirens on, which is not required in this situation. They arrived at the place and they asked for identification, which is part of the process. Now, if we don't like that process, that's a separate issue and we can discuss that. But as it stands, they were following the protocol as it stands, which is asking for the ID. At that point, the youth were refusing to show their ID and that's captured in the video somewhat. And it was substantiated by other people who have come forward and spoken um, to me and will not uh, reveal their names because again, <laughs> they are concerned about the backlash. So there are people who are supporting the um, what happened there was that the youth were refusing to show their ID that why do you need our ID? And there could be many reasons why they were uh, refusing to show their ID and not gonna go into that, but, um, but it was in that context when the youth said, uh, I have my rights and you don't, you, know, you don't have a right to ask me for the ID. It was in response to that, the erroneous statement was made. It is still incorrect. It is still wrong uh, that the police said, dude, you don't have, you've lost your rights. But he, when you hear it in the context, you've lost your rights because you have violated the noise bylaw and you need to show your ID the impact and the intention of that statement is very different than when we think of it as police going around and using their power to abuse power. So I just wanted to offer that context. Um, that being said, I am not judging the harm caused to anyone because we can never speak uh, for anybody. But what I do hear is again, the urgency to create a residence oversight board so we don't spend three months, so many of us struggling because we are not the right body to do that. And so again, I am urgently asking us to support the DEI director and giving her all the resources she needs to start working on creating a residence oversight board. Thank you. Um, D. Yes, um, so, you know, Shalini, I'm going to focus on the last part that you said, because that's really what we're here for, to talk about the urgency. Um, you know, uh, going back to the context, and these young people weren't charged with anything, you're, you're, you're putting false uh, <laughs> you're putting uh, false statements out there. I mean, if we go back to William Stewart's letter, he's telling you that these were three different pots of youth that were brought together. So, you know, what I don't, I don't understand some of the motives of people to prop up this, this inconsistency with people who we employ and pay to protect us, to protect our youth. I am really dismayed and I feel so disenfranchised by you for District 5. 
I really do to prop up that myth. So I just want to, you know, have us come back to what's really at hand, the urgency, as Shalini did say, about trying to repair and heal in this community. And I think we need to go back to what we asked. We even provided in a slide PowerPoint. So I don't know why any counselor would have missed it. The same message, the same message that we're bringing you here tonight. And I hope to God in the universe that we can finally settle it so these young people and their families could get on with their life and we could get on, uh, you know, trying to look at equity and community safety in, in uh, Amherst. Thank you. Philip. I just, uh, this is the first time that I'm speaking tonight, so I just want to thank everybody for speaking and members of the community. Uh, I've been a little bit quiet just because I'm reflecting on myself as a Mexican American citizen on Dia de los Muertos, so I just want to give attention to that for that moment. Um, but I want to talk to the point of protocol and procedure and systemic racism. We can have things in place that may make sense, yet the protocol is different for others. And I'll give you an example for my own personal self with the APD as a resident of this town. I work in this town and our alarm system goes off pretty often because people put in the wrong code. It goes off and to my understanding, you go out because the police, it triggers a police response and you show your ID, you verify who you are, and then you move about your day. I was sharing this information with a fellow colleague of mine who was white. And I told her this, that, you know, you're gonna need your ID, you're gonna need this, like make sure you know, say who you are. And another person came and also white said, what are you talking about? I never show my ID. They said, huh. So I went around to my colleagues, ones that I trusted, all white, and at first I thought it was possibly a gender thing. I thought maybe, you know, I might be a scary male walking around. So maybe that might be it. Then I went to my white colleagues that are male and they said, no, never shown an ID. I was the only person in the building that has to show an ID. And I don't know the reason why, other than that it has to be the color of my skin. And so therefore, if it is a protocol to ID someone, that an alarm triggering is going off makes sense to me yet that protocol is not practiced to any of my white colleagues it's only practiced against me a person of color and so with that i just want us to reflect on systemic racism as an overall issue of the town and that incident is dealt in with apd a relevant police department in this conversation. So I want us to possibly come up with the way, how do we at 842 at this meeting, come to all these action items that are to come and this meeting lasts way longer than it probably needs to. And with that, I'll end. Philip, that's a good point. Um, unless someone else would like to make a comment that is in the audience. We're going to get back to public comment for those of you that are in the audience. Um, I'm sorry. We are going to get back to public comment for those of you that are in the audience once we move to the next portion of the agenda. But is there anybody else in the audience who would like to say anything at this point during this discussion period? If not, we'll take a break. We're gonna come back. I'm going to move to the action items. And during action items, there will be an opportunity for both the members of CSSJC and the audience to make public comment. Okay. So let's take a break. It is 8.43. Let's plan to be back. Lynn, there's someone with a hand raised. Two people. I'm sorry. I'm sorry? 
There are two people with their hands raised for the public comment you just opened. No, we didn't open public comment. I'm sorry if that was misunderstood. We're going to open public comment again once we get into the action items. Is that acceptable, Pat? Uh, yes, so we're taking a break and then we're coming back and you're going to, going to have these people break, speak. Then we're going to come back and we're going to move to the action items. Michelle? Just to clarify, you did, Lynn, just say if anybody else in the audience would like to. You did. I, I misspoke. I'm, I'm very, very sorry. If there's anybody else who is in the room who would like to make any other comment, I do apologize for misspeaking. And to, for the people who are in the audience, there will be another public comment once we move into the action items. So with that, we're going to take a break until 8.55 and then come back. When you come back, please turn your video back on and we'll make sure everybody can hear you.
so that I know you're here. Okay. Uh, we need to begin to reassemble. Turn your video back on when you are back at your computer so that I know that you are here. I'm Lynn, I am here. As you return, please turn your video back on. As you return, please turn your video back on so that we know you're here. Uh, I'm just gonna ask people who don't have their videos on to just confirm that they can hear us and we can hear them. Deborah? Burrow. Yeah, I can hear you. I can't have my video on because I'm driving. Absolutely, Deborah. We understand that. That's why I decided to check with voice okay. versus videos. Thank uh, you. Kathy Shane, can you hear us? Yes. And Deborah, drive safely. Don't talk with your hands, okay? Thank you. Um, Anna, Devlin Goff here? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, Alicia Walker? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to assume all the other people can hear you. So what we agreed to was that during the action items, um, we're going to have, there, are, there were several motions submitted. Okay, let me just start with that. Several counselors submitted motions by noon yesterday. Those motions are posted along with the original motion in the packet and we're prepared to pull every one of those motions up. And while I had discussions with the town attorney at the motions, none of them are inappropriate. It's just that a lot of steps would be needed to be taken to do some of them. And we can talk about that as we go along. Um, as we proceed with the action items, uh, I'm going to call on people in the order in which the motions are printed, although I may forget who submitted what, and they are anonymous. Uh, and as Andy and others have asked, we're going to let people speak to their motions. But I want to make an observation before we move on. The real difference between the motions before you now although there's more motions that could be, could be put before you are. Do we form a working group? And if so, what is its charge? And, or do we ask the town manor, manager to address and his staff to address certain issues? And if so, what issues do we want them to address? Okay. Now, again, there may be other motions that I have not seen 
uh, although I'm aware of at least two that have been worked on since then. Um, so with that, we're going to start. Athena, are you, or is Sean putting the motions up? Or am I? I'll put them up. I think it's best if Sean or you can. Okay, so uh, in front of you is the, we can't see it very well, there we go. In front of you is the motion uh, that was made by Councillor Miller, by Michelle, on October 17th. That motion okay. is to refer the matter of the incident occurring on July 5th involving two police officers and nine youths to the CSSJC, HRC, AHRA to collaboratively review the incident with the input of the DEI department and other appropriate staff and in consultation with the town attorney for the purposes of making a recommendation to the town council to repair the harm and reconcile the incident by November 21st, 2022. I promise you, I'm not going to read all these motions. Um, mm -hmm. but, but Michelle, would you like to speak to that, Pat? Yes, I'm looking at this and it says motions postponed by Councillors Haneke and DeAngelis. I'm sorry, the phone is ringing. Um, I'm assuming I did not propo propose to postpone Michelle's motion. I'm sorry, Pat. That, that was a, that was a that was a bad copy paste on my part. I'll tell that you. Yeah. Absolutely incorrect. Thank um, you. It was a motion to postpone by Councilor Haneke. So, um, Michelle, you made this motion. You never had an opportunity to speak to it, and since then, I'm aware that you've given me another motion. Would you like to speak to this and also some sense of your next motion, which is the motion? that's on the sheet and it's the next one. And you can take these motions down for the moment. Yes, thank you. I would like to speak to the previous motion as well as to the new motion that I'm proposing tonight. And uh, I have tried to reserve my speaking time until now, so um, thank you. When I proposed a motion at the October 17th meeting, my hope was quite literally to create motion following months of inaction and recognizing that we are in conflict as a council and as a community about how to resolve this incident. While I wasn't sure what the ideal approach was, I had some goals. The first goal was to move the matter out of the town council so that deeper, more meaningful discussion could occur. The second was to defer to committees that were charged with issues related to human rights, public safety, social justice, and repair, all germane to this incident. Committees that are composed largely of black and brown residents in a community in which an overwhelmingly disproportionate level of power is in the hands of white people. The third was to create a process that in my heart and mind gave the community the best opportunity to heal and repair the harm that this incident has caused. In Ms. Romney's words, to engage in dialogue focused on bridging differences in the interest of community and justice. I believe in the process of reconciliation, of consensus building, of wading through the layers of complexity necessary to create meaningful and sustained change. I believe that repair is possible even in response to the darkest of matters. Tonight, I'm proposing a new motion that honors the spirit of my original motion and fleshes out what I see as a healthy and powerful pathway forward. This does not and should not preclude the council or the town manager from taking immediate and direct action on the recommendations made by the CSSJC, such as the creation of a resident oversight board, 
a justice compensation fund, and an immediate review of police policies in their July 29th letter. In fact, many of my colleagues have suggested such actions in their draft motions, with some, which I'm looking forward to hearing more about tonight. While I wholeheartedly believe in this approach that I'm offering, I'm open to other approaches that will bring justice and healing, and that will honor the committee that was put in place to advise on these matters. Before I read my motion, I, or maybe I won't read it, maybe it's not going to be read out loud, but before the motion is read, or, or however we'll proceed with the motion, I want to clarify two things. Establishing consensus about what has transpired is the first step in a reconciliation process. Consensus does not mean we will all agree on all things. It helps us to navigate through our conflict and differences in an intentional way. It helps us to build trust and create spaces for listening to diverse perspectives. From that space, the group can develop a proposal that honors the deeper wisdom of the community. The purpose of my proposed committee is not to reinvestigate the matter, to cross over into executive roles, or to violate the privacy of a staff member or members. It is about creating a democratic process guided by committees that were created to address such matters made up largely of black and brown people to develop a recommendation that can repair and heal our community. And so with that, uh, however you'd like to go forward with, would you like me to read the motion, Lynn, or? No, we're, um, why don't you describe the motion? Okay. Sure. Yeah. So the motion um, calls for an ad hoc committee. Um, the appointments would come um, from the president of the town council. It would include nine voting members um, and the members would be three counselors, two members of the community safety and social justice committee, two members of the human rights commission, two members of the African Heritage Reparation Assembly, and one non-voting community liaison member of the APD. Um, the purpose, of course, is to develop a proposal for repair and reconciliation, the focus on the incident um, that we're discussing, the matter of July 5th between two police officers and nine youths. The proposal will be in accordance with Massachusetts general law and other laws, regulations, and policies. I propose that the committee shall clarify definitions and establish a shared language, shall establish consensus on the factual record of what transpired during the incident, establish consensus on the factual record of follow-up regarding the incident through the present, identify and recognize specific harms caused from the in incident through the present, research and explore models for repair, including procedural policy and compensatory options, and then to develop a proposed plan for repair, including a concrete pro process for handling future similar incidents. And um, the town manager, APD, and the DEI and CREST director would participate in meetings and discussions as uh, relevant and deemed appropriate by the body. Um, we would obtain legal review by the town attorney as needed and then report back. And I am very flexible with this date. Uh, this date was February 6, 2023, which does seem way too long considering um, what we've are, how long we've already waited to address this. However, um, if we're establishing a committee and going to go through this process, it could take us some time to do so, but I'm open to an amendment on that. Um, and then, of course, the report would be um, provided to the town council with its recommendations um, by whichever date we decided. Okay. Thank you. Can we, can we take this down for the moment? Um, pardon me, is the is Councillor Miller making this motion at this time? She is not at this time. I'm not? No. Because I, what I heard people say was they wanted all of the motions to be presented and have the person who, and I'm willing to do this in any number of ways as long as we all agree, the person making the motion would present it, not look for seconds or anything else, and that they would then speak to their motion, which you did, 
And then we would go on and make sure people understand the rest of the motions that are in the docket. Is that is that the what we agreed to? And that sounds like a fair process to me. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Dorothy, you have your hand up. I just wanted to say I thought that Michelle did a great job in her thoroughly thought through and researched uh, motion. And um, I like it best of all of them, um, partly because of that, but also because it has the NYPD or representative at the table. And I think that's very important. I think, and not to use the committees that we've set up recently would be then what do we do? What, why do we make them in the first place, you know, and have them do all this extra work of showing up and having meetings. So I think it, the, and I like it that it's balanced uh, between the, um, counselors um, and the, um, um, I think it's a great, it's a great group. And I think it includes the police at the table and it involves the town manager and the DEI as they see fit and as the committee sees fit. So I think it's a great I, compromise. What I'd like to do is have an opportunity for each of the people who made put forward motions to speak to their motion. And then we'll go and start deciding what to do with them, okay? Um, and let me just say motion two actually was one of my two motions. And Lynn, I- Lynn, can we ask a question, Michelle? Absolutely, a question? Kathy, go ahead. Okay, I just want to ask you, Michelle, are you the, uh, substitute motion are you substituting the motion that has the different parts to it for the motion you made a week ago i'm actually offering withdrawing and offering a new motion that, uh, that's that's what i was asking so that the motion on the table you're withdrawing and saying here's what i'm proposing so that's what so i'm just i'm actually going to put an x through one so i know how many i'm working with thank you sure pat is this a clarifying question um, I'm, I'm interested in why only the APD is listed and why not a representative of CRESS, but I can hold that question. Okay. Okay. Let's again, try to get the various options out on the table and see if there are others. All right. The second motion is one of the two I submitted. I keep looking for solutions and never sure I'm have one. Uh, and this was similar to what Michelle offered, but it's more limited in its scope because it was a recommend to recommend to the town council a program of action to promote repair and reconciliation in the Amherst community. Um, I can am more than glad to speak to why I limited this. Uh, but I can also save that because there is a second time that I also have a motion at the very end. Uh, but let me just say that I am concerned that, and you can take the motion down, okay? I truly recognize and acknowledge that people have been harmed, okay? And I, I truly recognize the determination and serious commitment of the CSSJC members to make sure that that harm is recognized and addressed. What concerns me is, I'm trying to choose my words carefully and it's very hard. What concerns me is that because of what we've learned mostly through the African Heritage Reparations Assembly discussions about their uh, discussions regarding a fund for money that would go to individuals is that is a could take a long period of time because it would need legislative action. Whether we want to pursue that or not is not, I'm not, that's not my question on the table. 
it just would take a long period of time. And I would like to see us begin to do some additional things that help repair the community, okay? Whether the committee structure is the right way to go or not, I debate that to, to this day, okay? But my goal was trying to put forward something where other pursuits can be happening, but there is a discussion and some commitment to activities that re help repair the community and, excuse me, create the conversations that I think many of us, while, while we may be um, afraid to have them, we need to have. So that was my goal in that motion. Um, I'm not going to go into anything more at this point, but Andy, you had the next one. Yes, I did. Uh, let me first say that, uh, uh, well, some people are not sure. In fact, I was listening very carefully to all of the comments and discussion that was happening in the first part of the meeting. And I chose not to speak during that entire time because I decided at this point, it was my learning opportunity. And the only way I could learn was to hear from all of you. So I wanna thank everybody who spoke at the beginning part of the meeting. Uh, what happened at the last meeting, and I think we all were um, distressed by um, the way that it played out in the end. And um, I regret that. When we got to the point that Michelle made the motion that was on the table at the last meeting, I had several concerns about it. I appreciated the fact that she was trying to think about establishing a process to move forward. Um, there were some concerns that I had about it. And I think that her substitute addresses some of the same issues that I put in the amended version of her motion, which is motion three, because I wanted to make sure that we had a small enough group that it really could work together and have effective conversation. Because the one, one of the things was evident in our last meeting is that when it gets contentious, a large group, and that would have even been larger than we had because it was combining three committees, um, could have been um, quite out of hand. Second of all, um, I felt that the lack of council representation was problematic. Um, and the third is that I didn't want to use any language in the motion setting it up that assumed a finding that the committee would ultimately be charged to make. And I was a little bit anxious about some wording along those lines that was suggesting uh, an outcome or uh, of a process that we were just setting up or findings that we were just setting up. So that was the purpose of it. I don't see any reason to pursue the motion that I have made as motion three because it um, has now been um, in, incorporated in several others. Remember when, when I wrote it, um, I did not see anybody else's work and nobody saw my work. So it was all a matter of uh, each of us working independently of each other. And uh, so I'm not going to ask to pursue mine separately because I think that the principles are incorporated elsewhere. The other thing that um, I wanted to say was in regard to um, number five, which we will get to in a moment, that um, it is a model of uh, moving forward with uh, getting the um, oversight board established and looking at the process to establish the oversight board and what the oversight board might look like. And um, I uh, am very intrigued by that concept. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. So Andy, I am taking from what you just said that you are withdrawing your motion. Yes, you can go ahead and make that assumption. I am withdrawing the motion. Okay. 
Thanks. Motion four. I believe, Mandy Jo, your motion four. Yep. Um, so there are two there because I wanted to separate two separate issues um, instead of trying to combine them into one motion. Um, in thinking about the motion that I had postponed discussion on um, from two weeks ago so that I could think about what the that one was asking and where it was going and what it was seeking and what the repercussions of that would be. Um, I came to a conclusion that I think it's more appropriate for the town manager to be doing the investigation than for us to be forming another committee or asking other committees to do so. Um, you know, our charter tasks our town manager with supervising, directing, and being responsible for the administration of town activities, um, for administering personnel policies, practices, contracts, rules, regulation, rules and regulations, and for investigating and inquiring into the affairs of any town agency under the authority of the manager. Um, and so, you know, what I thought about in terms of how do we move forward, and I thank Michelle for proposing something that tries to find a way to take action um, was that um, we probably do need a review of our public safety protocols. Um, it's clear that there is unhappiness with how um, those protocols are being executed or whether those protocols are even appropriate or industry standard. I don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure any of our committees could know the answer to that. Um, but I, I, I would entrust that our town manager could figure it out or hire or consultants or consult the right people to figure out what industry standard for response to particularly incidents involving minors should be. Um, and so the first of the two motions is, is to look at dealing with what, how do we deal with incidents or calls that when police show up or crest show up have minors involved. Um, I don't know what the best answer to that is. And so I think the manager is the right person to task with looking at those rules and regulations to make sure they are um, appropriate and what our town wants, but also fall within the appropriate um, standards or protocols that um, are out there. And then the second one is, um, you know, response to the calls for a resident oversight committee. I am not sure that residents who have no experience um, or limited experience in overseeing public safety actions um, is the right way to go for an independent oversight authority. It may be. I'm not expert enough or knowledgeable enough to know if that's the right way. And so the second motion is, is trying to task the town manager again, because I think he's more, the more appropriate um, place to do this, to figure out what the options are for having some oversight, um, when, particularly when there are community concerns about the response to an incident um, and that oversight not being personnel within the public safety department, whether that be our DEI director, whether it be a combination of other staff in town, whether it be a combination of staff and community people, I don't know. And so this motion goes to the, trying to say, let's explore those options and see what we have option-wise, what we could do and what we believe, give us some thoughts on what the most appropriate for our town may be. It may end up being a resident oversight committee. It may end up being something else, but it would give us, I'm hoping a way, the recommendation back and the report back would give us a way to talk about specifics instead of just a general, we need a resident oversight committee or we need some sort of independent investigative authority. Um, we'd be able to talk about the specifics of how that would operate, who would be involved and things like that. So that's where I was going with my two motions. Okay. Dorothy, do you have a clarifying question? Yes, just so you're proposing not to study or clarify the issue 
but to to work on some of the things that the committees have recommended, um, which seem reasonable. Uh, but you you've left out the committees that we have created, which have BIPOC people on them. And I think you guys know that I have really been a fan of the town manager. Um, but at this moment, he's a white man. And I've heard some people of color saying that they thought maybe it was time that they had a chance to actually try to deal with one of these things. And so I would suspect the town manager would not want to have the whole burden of this put on himself, which is why he has been such an enthusiastic person in creating Cress and in helping set up the committees. So I'm just putting forward that as a possibility. Thank you. Anna. Thank you. Uh, the second motion, Mandy, is this uh, is this not currently underway? And I'm curious to know if this is saying start over for the work that's been done from the DEI director on um, establishing a process for the resident oversight board. Um, how does this differ? Is it the same? Does that? I'm actually, hey, Mandy, Joe, do you want to address that? Sure, please. Um, I, I don't intend it to be a start over. Um, I would expect it to be in, uh, any work or any reporting to incorporate everything that's already been done, but but to also, you know, if that's the way that the man, you know, that we think is the appropriate way, a resident oversight board, that's great. I just don't know. So I didn't want to say that's the right one, go do that. Um, but okay. I also think it's a way to endorse through council action, any of the work that is already being done. Okay, thank you. Pam? Um, I, I like the fact that you are um, pushing forward on uh, safety protocols, public safety protocols. I like the fact that you are um, looking at, uh, you know, how to respond to, to complaints and basically create the, the um, oversight authority. Um, however, I'm I'm a little concerned that you know what you're asking is for the supervisor to create a team, uh, basically of without without specificity, but create a team that reviews internal processes and does not appear to allow independent thinking or thought. And there's obviously again no no inclusion of the groups that have already been formed. So I like some of the action items, but I don't think I could support either of the two motions um, without uh, some of the others um, guidelines that were in motion number one. Thanks. Jennifer. Yeah, I thought that a resident, that the DEI director had been tasked with forming, that was one of her um, you know, goals for the year, resident oversight board. So I'm confused about why we'd be revisiting that. I, I was assuming that was in process. I guess that's that a question. That has been our understanding is that it's in process. Uh, Mr. Bachman, would you like to speak to that? Sure, I have other things to say, but maybe at this moment, yeah, it is in process. The DEI director has a um, a schedule and a plan for implementation. I think you know we could look at expediting that uh, through uh, including an outside consultant who could come in to make that move faster. That would be one one consideration that we she and I had talked about. But again, so we don't need to revisit whether we want this. This is going, this is happening. Yeah, that's up to the council if it would like to, to reiterate and reinforce that this is an important thing that you would like to see a recommendation uh, by date certain. Um, my concern was that it not be revisited and not happen. So I just wanted it clarity that this is happening and it's already been a, a council recommendation or goal. Um, okay, this, the next motion was uh, submitted by Shalini. Um, and I- Kathy Shane, and Kathy Shane. And Kathy Shane. Uh, so there are two parts to the motion that Kathy Shane and I are proposing. The first part speaks to the urgency we've all been hearing about accountability and a process 
uh, that's needed immediately, urgently to deal with complaints against the police in general. So with respect to that goal, one of the key responsibilities that uh, Mr. Bockelman just shared with us is that Ms. Nolan, who is the new DEI director, she's a black woman who has shown that she's very competent and compassionate attorney and is a very capable leader of our new DEI department. One of her first responsibilities was and is to create the resident oversight board. So I hope that we can all support Ms. Nolan in successfully reaching that goal in a timely manner. And it is my understanding that the creation of a resident oversight board for the reasons that Mandy Jo just shared is like, who's gonna be in it? How do we create it? And so it is a highly complex and specialized job, which is why uh, we are recommending that we signal our support uh, to Ms. Nolan by directing the town manager to hire a consultant if necessary, which we think, I mean, if necessary, but to work with the DI department in the creation of the resident oversight board. So that's the first part of the motion to direct the town manager to hire a consultant to collaborate with the DI department. And the second part of our motion deals, um, I mean, it's flipped, I think I spoke to the first, second first, but the second part of our motion is to deal with the July 5th incident specifically. And what we're proposing is that, uh, you know, when I, uh, that, for example, when I go as a consultant in an organization, I like to understand the culture and uh, like to understand the specific challenges they're facing. And so similarly, the consultant that we are hiring could use this July 5th incident as a case to review, to look at all the information and to use that to inform uh, not only the creation of the resident oversight board, but also to use that to review and uh, propose potential procedural changes in the operation of the police department. So Kathy, did you wanna add to that? Shalini explained it well. I just want to add some thoughts because we actually tried to write it with very few words. Um, so the first part of reviewing information, um, I think we mean a thorough review of it. And it's, it's to learn from the July 5th incident, including we might want to approach 911 calls about noise with youths differently, um, with high school age youths and think about what the follow-up is and how we speak with people. So we didn't write all of that in, but it was really to come back with, how can we prevent this from happening again? And that was one of my concerns with the original proposal that was on the table, is it was just one incident focused. I think we need to be creative and move on. We have a crest and a DEI just beginning, as I mentioned in my early remarks, we can build on them. I think there's a potential for Cress to be part of a team once we know what their workload is, once we know what the peak load is on when they're responding, they're not ready now, but we're staffed in a way that six months, eight months from now, they could be part of a team responding on weekends. Um, and we could have that be part of the recommendation. And I agree, we have assumed there will be a resident oversight board or re recommendation, but I don't actually remember voting on it. So I wanted to make sure we had a motion to make this happen. And Paul just suggested that we give a date certain, at least on when each of these can happen, when each of these would occur. We're putting in place some very powerful uh, tools to use. And we've got very competent people, including this amazing new workforce. And I think we need to give them all a chance to work. Um, and work well together to move forward. Okay. Thank you. Um, if we go to motion six, so in my conversations with the town attorney, she volunteered to uh, draft a motion. That's the motion you see here. However, I'm going to ask Athena to put up 
the motion that I sent you earlier this evening, or actually, yes, late this afternoon, uh, which is a modification of this. And uh, there we go. Uh, and it's the same opening, but it gets into more detail, particularly scroll down through the numbers and includes various things related to the demands that were made by the CSSJC. Um, I'd like to, and, but this would be to refer this to the town manager who would work with the DI department and other staff and draw upon the ongoing work of the CSSJC, the Human Rights Commission and the HRA. Um, it's, it looks like a long list, but it was a list of demands. So I just want to take an opportunity to speak a little bit about this. Several counselors today have recognized the many strides we've already made. And in, we don't have to list them again. I remember reading the CSWG reports, both report A and B. I remember making a matrix, bringing it to the council. I remember drafting a response to the seven demands of the CSSJC. So if there's times that I feel maybe sound a little frustrated, um, it's because I keep trying to move something forward. And um, I get very concerned when the council has continually been asked to be the judge and the jury when we don't have any of those powers. And so when it comes to saying, yes, there was wrong, we can agree there was wrong, we can agree there was harm, but we don't have the specifics and we have no basis to award any compensation based on that. And so that is one of my biggest concerns about continually investigating the incident within the bodies of the town. So let me further say, I also find myself regularly worrying about how much we've taken on and about the missteps that we may still take. And I worry about the fact that nationally and locally, our police departments are constantly either being condemned because they didn't show up like they didn't show up in Velda and people lost their lives, or they did show up in St. Louis. Unfortunately, not as many lives were lost. I worry when people say we don't want the police to show up, that the time that they need to show up and be there to protect the lives of children and citizens, that they aren't welcome. Our police department is considered one of the best in Massachusetts. That doesn't mean they're always right. Amherst is considered one of the best towns in Massachusetts. It doesn't mean we're always right. And what people have put forth is different ways to help all of us look at this, not in a way that condemns, but in a way that allows us to move forward. And I really hope before we dismiss tonight that we do this because we have put it off way too long. That matrix was over a year ago. So I want, just need to say, we have to keep our sense of perspective. We also have to understand what's truly doable with regard, regard to our finances. The council has to either decide it is or is not, an adjudicatory body, we are not. Our, our legal counsel is very clear about that. 
we also have to decide if we are going to seek a, a victim's compensation fund. And if we are, what does it look like? And it's going to have to go through the legislature. But meantime, if we keep having discussions like we've been having, where we keep calling people out instead of calling people in, we're just gonna make more harm in Amherst. And I'm looking for a way to move forward. I'm willing to go with whichever way the council comes up with tonight, but please, please make it a way to move forward. That's all I have to say. Anna, did you wanna say anything? I, I just have a request to Athena, if she could, since now it's been posted up on the screen, if she could email Lynn's alternate version to us so that we can see it on our own screens, that, that would be very be, helpful. That would be excellent. Thank you, Athena. It also, when she emails it to you, it is an option one and an option two. And the option two is greatly pared down. Uh, and I, at one point, worked to try to take away the opening language because I don't want to get into the debate of the words, but um, I, want to, I want to deal with the substance gang and I want to deal with it so that we leave this meeting tonight with a path forward so that we're not sitting here a year from now and we've done some great things, but we still are upset and we still feel what's been going on. Thank you. Anna? I, do, I do know that Anna might have another motion. Spoiler alert. So in hearing the rationale behind some of the motions today, one, I wanna thank uh, folks for writing them and presenting them. It was really helpful. And I'm not convinced that my thought needs to be a motion necessarily, however, uh, and if it's not, it could be something I do on my own and not as uh, not on behalf of the council. But I think that one of the things that has emerged for me very prominently in this is that clarity of process is so important. And one of the other things that has emerged for me is that we have not addressed each point, point by point of the letter that we received from the CSSJC in our initial draft response, which we never approved, I know, however... We never went through every single point. And that's not to say that we as a council are promising that we will deliver on every single point. We would have to vote on that. But I believe that we need to address what process would look like for each of those items. So in considering how to move forward, I got a bit stuck on the original motion that was on the table because in my opinion, CSSJC had already given us a list of items that they believed would move us towards repair and reconciliation, as well as reduce and prevent future harm. I'm a process person. I'm a process nerd. I love thinking about this and figuring out how to work on these systems so that we can clarify how to make change and how to move forward. So I think it's critical that we as a council respond with a clear process and support our committees in clarifying what it would take to move forward each item that they've listed in their letters. So I looked back at a note I had sent to Lynn a while ago where I had tried to look at each item on the original list and identify what the path forward would be. Um, and then uh, Lynn provided a, a, a different draft response because we weren't working on it together because we weren't in subcommittee, but I had sent her my thoughts. She wrote her draft response to the council on, in early October. What my motion would do, it would allow, I can't, I, can I read it? Am I allowed to read it without sure. making it? Okay. So it would task the town council vice president to identify the appropriate first steps in a process needed to move forward on each of the seven demands from the community safety and social justice committee uh, letter dated July 29th, 2022, determining whether each item requires direct council action, directs the town manager, or directs the town manager and town staff with reporting back deadlines. So the motion means I would look at each item and determine whether it, not by basis of opinion, but by basis of whether it's legislative, executive, et cetera, uh, whether it's the responsibility of the town council or the town manager. 
I originally thought of also drafting motions for each item on that list to say this would be the first step in each item. However, I believe that the motion crafting for each of those items should be the prerogative of a counselor who would choose to bring forward a motion on that item to the council, because that's how we get things done, right? We make motions on, on actions that we wanna see taken. We are a legislative body. We as individual counselors can make motions to enact policy by a vote of the council, we can task the town manager with something that falls under the executive body, executive branch, or something we want the town manager and staff to address and bring to the council for a recommendation. It's not all we do, but those are the options that I believe apply to this list. The idea here is that I take the original list from CSSJC and for each item, I know I'm getting repetitive, but I wanna make sure it's clear. The idea here is I take that original list from CSSJC and for each item determine whether it would be action from the executive branch, Paul's area, and require a vote of the council to task the town manager with action, whether that's already been done, because if that has been done, great, we can you know, step to that, and or whether it would take action from the legislative branch and require a vote on of the council on a specific action step that's policy-based. So in making this motion, I wanna be clear in, in order to take action on each individual demand listed in the letter, future individual motions would have to be made by counselors who are seeking to carry forward said item from the list. I think it's important that we respond to each point of that letter and clarify what it would take to move it forward. I'm tasking this to myself solely because I started doing this work and I am happy to accept suggestions from other counselors. We cannot have two or more counselors doing this without it being an open meeting or a subcommittee. So what I then am seeing is that there are motions that are addressing many of the points and taking action on many of the points in the letter, which is amazing. And there are some things we have not talked about. And I think it's important that we identify for our committees and for ourselves, hey, if we want to take action on items two and three, I don't know what they are, I'm just referencing random numbers, it would mean a counselor would need to craft a motion to ask the town manager to prioritize it, or it would mean a counselor would need to draft legislation for this. We don't have a lack of clarity, and I believe, Mandy, this might have been what you were referring to earlier when you said you weren't clear on what was being asked of the council. We have not clarified which is legislative action for ourselves, which is legislative action, which is executive action. And then we have not taken ownership of our responsibility as counselors to then say, I'm picking up the, the banner on this and I'm gonna carry it forward and write that motion and put it on the agenda because that's the next step, right? Once we know wh where it needs to go eventually, one of us has to pick it up and say, I'm bringing this to the council. I'm putting it on the agenda. We're going to discuss the motion that I have written to move this along. So I'm not necessarily convinced this needs to be a motion. I'm happy to just do this. Um, but I think we need to really consider that we have not addressed every single point in that letter and clarified what it would mean to move forward. Um, before we move any to any questions, I'd like to pause for a moment and say, I have also just forwarded the motion that was sent to the council that was up on the screen that I made to the members of the CSSJC. And I'm asking Athena to post that as well so that it is available to the public. Now I'm going to ask Anna, would you like me to email to the town council and to the members of CSSJC? what you just, the motion you just made, and would you like it posted? Um, I'd like to hear from Alicia first, if that's okay. Okay, Alicia. Um, thank you, and I have a little bit to say, so if you all could just bear with me while I make the connection, it will take a couple of seconds, um, because I, again, want to just bring forward some of my emotions and my frustration with this entire process. Um, and like some of my frustration comes from like, I understand we're trying to find a path forward and I'm very happy about that, but we have been in this position before. And so some of the remarks that like, we don't know what specific policies can be changed and we need more information on these things is false because we had, we worked with LEAP. They investigated all of the police policies. We have a, an entire report with specific policies that can be changed. We have made these recommendations over a year ago with the help of professionals. 
not just random people on a body. Seasoned, knowledgeable community members who are also professionals. Like this was not just willy-nilly thrown together. We have concrete recommendations to the council that were made well over a year ago in terms of the police policy, in terms of the resident oversight board, what the charge could be, what the composition of the members could be. All of these things are already concrete recommendations with consultation of professionals with a year work of research from this specific community to back it. We don't need more research. We just don't. Um, and that is the frustration. And so the piece that is really stuck for me, why I like, I do like Michelle's motion because I do also agree that it is important to have consensus. It's important for all of these things to also happen. But what Anna said, I think is like so critically important because everything that can't happen, our reason is, well, the policy, the procedure, the this, it's written this way. And so when we're talking about what is in our purview as counselors and like what we have authority to do, it's strange to me that we are sitting here acting like we don't have as much power as we do. Because we can make a recommendation as to anything that we cannot do ourselves. We have done it before in terms of like requesting funding for the library. Like it is in not in our purview to actually obtain that funding from the state, but we are recommending people and we are putting our voices where we think our priorities are and what is important to us. And we can do that again. We can do that for any situation. We can instruct the town manager to do anything that we think is important that is not in our purview, but is in his. We can also write recommendations to the finance committee. We do all of these things all of the time for other issues. There are a lot of things we can do. And one of the things that I think we really should do and can do, which would be really important, is identify specific policies and procedures, which is why I love what Anna is saying in terms of going through each specific point and laying out what the policy and procedure is. We can identify which policies and procedures are preventing us from moving forward, and we can change them. That is in our purview as a council. We made all of these policies. There were people on committees that made all of these policies. All of these policies that are here that are preventing us from doing things can be changed and we can be a part of that process. And so I think that Anna's specific recommendation is like a perfect starting place for that, to go through each thing that we want to see happen or that might be possible and to look at what policies would allow us to do these things and what policies are preventing us from doing these things and what does the actual process look like? What processes are working for us as a town in, in making change and what processes are preventing us from moving forward? Because we can change those things. And so while I really support actually like a combination of things that have been suggested tonight, the conversation is still slightly frustrating. Anna, I did send this on to council members and to the members of CSSJC because I yeah that's fine it, it makes sense puts it out there yep uh, Pam thanks to everybody that has put the work into this um, I'm feeling like it's actually we're we're really sort of at the moment talking about two different things and I appreciate the work that that Anna's talking about uh, breaking it apart moving it forward I think that's excellent. I think I would <clears throat> I would like to vote on sorry <clears throat> I would like to vote on a motion uh, that deals specifically with uh, the July five incident and get that rolling. I and, and I strongly support motion number one amendment um, in in order to get that doing going. But I would also say okay, so then step two for the council is to say thank you very much, Anna. Um, would you come back with a report uh, and a breakdown of, of your items, you know, in in two two weeks or whatever, you know, let's let's break it apart. Let's let's move on both of these actions, but not get bogged down in having to do all the analysis um, from the the uh, the CSWG report now. Does that make sense? Uh, we're not making. We're not moving at this point. In fact, I'll take more comments and then we can decide whether we want to have motions and or go to public comment and then come back. Kathy Shane. 
I, I will make uh, what is probably not going to be a popular comment, but I think one of the reasons we didn't deal with the whole matrix is there were some elements on it that I didn't necessarily think I would support that we need to have a longer discussion on them. So it wasn't just a, how would we do this, but do we want to do this? And would it make sense to do this? And Elisha, I do totally respect the amount of time and effort that was put on your committee. But I also think there are experts and then there are experts. These are complicated issues that can't, most of them take time. So just as we, brought on a Crest workforce, we know conceptually what we hope they're gonna be able to do. It's not day one. And they're working out something that's gonna be creative, new, different, and will be a model. I hopefully a very positive model if we let it play out. So in my past life, I had to deal with competing experts regularly and just sit down and have the time on complicated issues to figure out, do we want to do it or not? And I'll just end there because we do have finite resources in the town. People may not believe it, but when we look at our budgets, they're finite. And right now I am in a panic about trying to refocus on getting an elementary school built for our kids. We're over half the kids are minority and we have a high number of low income kids. And so I think we need to say we're also dealing with competition for scarce resources um, and, and just acknowledge that. So I just wanna say, Lynn, it wasn't that we didn't focus on the whole matrix, but there were elements of the matrix we never got to because it wasn't like a, this is number one. We never even talked about it. And that is why I think Shelly and I focus more narrowly on two things we wanna do. And I don't wanna spend a lot of committee time on just one incident, I want to talk about it broadly. So maybe we're talking about merging some of these emotions because I don't think we just want to go back over the July 5th, get all the facts right and talk just about that. We want to talk about the protocols, ways of preventing it from happening again, or if it happens again, knowing how to deal with it better than a four month process. So I'll stop there. Sean, we're going to need to use the clock, okay? Thank you. Andy? Yeah, uh, a lot of uh, what Kathy said is what I was thinking too. Um, I really appreciate what the Community Safety Working Group recommendations were. They were quite extensive. Um, I understand that there's overlap and change in the current list that we have from CSS um, WTA because um, it's, uh, you know, reacting to a specific incident and um, so that it's um, focusing a little bit in that direction. But in the end, um, I, the point that Kathy made was the point that I was gonna make is that we don't have um, infinite resources. We have very limited resources. Um, we have accomplished a lot, but it is very costly and we are really, needing to make sure that we're focused on continuing the efforts, the success of the efforts that we've already made or we jump into large expensive new efforts. And I think that the last thing I would put out there is that the word expensive is the, not just the um, operating costs of setting up whatever it is or the capital costs needed to set it up, but it's also, the incredible amount of staff time and resources that it's going to take just to explore each of these items and to find out what is necessary to move forward. Uh, so I have a lot of um, hesitation because I think it's important for us to spend some time um, as a council thinking about the question of priorities uh, and not um, try and uh, go into an episode where we're trying to do everything and therefore find we can do nothing. Alicia. Um, thank you, Lynn. I forgot to add at the end of my last statement, if that does not become a motion, 
um, that I would be happy to work on that with you, Anna, because I think that is a critical next step and it would be important for my learning process because I really wanna know those things. Um, so I'd be happy to work on that with you. It'd be like a learning curve for me, but I will do that if it doesn't become a motion. Um, also, like I, I am proud of the steps that we are taking as a town because you know I also did put a lot of work into the, the CRESS program and the DEI director and I'm happy, so, so happy to see those things being carried out. But the framing of the conversation is almost as if we think that the creation of these things is gonna eradicate all of the racism and discrimination in this town. It absolutely will not at all. And it won't merely even start to begin to touch the harm that has already happened. And I think that is a big piece that is missing from this conversation. These are great big steps, like they are, and we should be proud of these things as a town. It's not going to end what is happening here. It's not going to end the experiences of people. It's not going to end the injustice. It's not going to end the policies that allow racism to continue to occur in this town. It's not going to end the trauma that people have already experienced. It's not, it's not going to do any of those things. And so I think like, yes, we need to celebrate those things and be happy about those things, but we still need to do more things. And like, I'm sorry, but we don't want to hear about how expensive it is. Priorities are also a matter of perspective. And again, we are missing perspective, the perspective of the people who this is happening to. Priorities are a matter of perspective. We all have different priorities because we all have different perspectives. And again, the council, that's why it needs to be more diverse because we're missing a lot of perspective. And so our priorities don't necessarily align with the priorities of the actual people in this town. And that's what makes this conversation so, so, so difficult. And so I think like, yeah, we do need to have more conversations about this clearly. I understand that there's not like one thing we can do tonight that's going to solve everything. I think establishing a committee that can focus on this more clearly because it deserves that level of and detail of attention that as a council, we just cannot do because we have so many other things on our plate. But I, but I don't like, I just always have trouble with the framing of the conversation as if it's not urgently critical to the daily lives and well being of a lot of people. Mandy Jo. I support a lot of what Kathy and Andy said, and I just want to recognize for Alicia that that you're right. Um, we all come here with different perspectives on what our priorities are, and that's what makes conversations around budgeting really difficult because it is a zero-sum game in some sense. There's a limited pot of money, and elevating one priority generally necessarily Dis, diselevates not the right word, but um, reduces another priority or the funding you can spend on another priority. And so that's what makes budgeting so hard. Um, I wanna go back to the first motion that was discussed, because I think a couple of counselors have said they might support that one. Um, I still struggle with that one, um, partially because of the committee creation, but also, partially because if we as a council have an idea of what needs done, i.e. something like we need to get the resident oversight committee going, or we need to review the policies of the and the protocols that are used in response procedures used by the police department, if we have a, as a council know that that's some of the things we want to do, I'm not sure we need a committee to come back and tell us that's what we should do. I feel like we should just tell the manager to do that. Um, and that's why I struggle with sort of the creation of a committee to, it, it's described here as to quote, develop a proposal for repair and reconciliation with a focus on the incident. But if we've already sort of potentially reached a consensus on what at least some of that 
repair and reconciliation would be, why wouldn't we just direct the manager to execute that as CEO? Um, so I guess that's why I'm hesitant. That's why I favor the motions that just go directly towards asking the manager to do something, which would be sort of the latter half motions instead of the first motions. Michelle? I'm just going to respond to Mandy on that. Um, it's not, I, I, I agree that if we have concrete steps that we're all willing to take, we could have a much more direct approach. Um, my concern is that those committees need to be guiding the process and they need to be involved in the process. So for example, if we say, um, you know, that we're going to establish a board or that whatever these, these uh, specific goals that we're talking about tonight, if we're ready to move forward on them and ask the town manager to do so, they need to be guided by these committees, in my opinion, at least the, the CSSJC um, needs to be guiding that work. And I think that the concern is that the town manager would take it and it wouldn't, and and this isn't default to you necessarily, Paul, but just that it wouldn't happen in consultation and in the day in the public light of day, you know, it would be happening um, and, and being developed outside of that and then be brought back to us. So um, I wanted to address that. I also wanted to address something that Kathy said, which um, just to clarify that my motion does take it further and does uh, ask for a recommendation on how to handle future incidents that could occur um, like this. Um, and then lastly, I want to address my concerns with what Anna has proposed. Um, while I really appreciate what Anna is proposing, um, my concern is that letter was sent to us by the CSSJC in July. And um, that matrix was developed, you know, a year and a half ago, and it's hasn't really moved anywhere. And my concern is that we can go through and we can determine what process for each of these items. But if this council isn't ready to have a discussion about freezing police or whatever, you know, all of the other items on there that coming back with a process for how to do these things and whether or not we can do them to me could create um, unnecessary stall. And, um, and I, I feel that we need to, be much more progressive than that. So that's that's what I have right now. Anna? Sure. So if there are no counselors who are willing to champion freezing police positions, it won't matter whether it comes from a new committee or it comes from the current committee. Counselors would need to propose that as a motion and bring it forward and champion it. That doesn't shift regardless of how we move forward with this, right? That's where I'm, that's, that's, why I believe we need to pinpoint the specific actions we need to take because we are the ones who are responsible for moving things forward. And so, you know, I, I'm struggling with the idea of doing work a third time that's been done. Like these answers have been provided to us twice now through the um, community safety working group. And then again, from the CSSJC. So it's it's on us to say, okay, this is the path forward. And to address Kathy's comment, to be, again, very clear, every single one of these would have to be picked up by a counselor or multiple counselors turned into a motion and an action and then pass the council. This is not saying that the slate of these can come forward. I'm not able to bring every single one of these to the table right now and get it passed, right? I think that what I am able to do is say, if a counselor on this council would like to move forward on the issue of a, um, a victim's compensation fund. The first step would be to think about what legislation would look like. That's a policy action. If you would like to increase the, the hours that Crest is working, that's a town manager decision. You're going to need to write a motion that prioritizes that. Those motions need to pass council. That doesn't change regardless of what committee is making recommendations. So I think for me, you're right. The letter was sent to us in July and we, or the incident happened in July. 
and we haven't moved yet. I don't want to push it out further and, and get new recommendations um, because this, it's not an if this happens again, it's a when. And so we can't just keep waiting for the next thing to happen to, to write rec new recommendations every time. We have to start acting on something. So um, that's where I'm, I'm feeling an echo of, you know, of Alicia's frustration because I was an observer to that work and she was very much in it. But I think that this is where we've, being handed the answers and saying, we gotta go back to study is, is frustrating. Um, and so I think that there's, there's still studying to be done and there's action to be taken. And so I'm, I'm trying to illuminate what those paths would be so that my fellow counselors and myself can pick up the ones that we are ready to walk down and say, here's the action, let's go. That's, that's the intent behind my motion. Okay. I'm gonna move on to Anika. All right, thank you. Um, so I wanna thank everyone who spoke and who's with us today. Um, and I'm recognizing that we have um, 74 uh, participants and I'm also looking at the screen um, and we have the CSSJC represented here, majority of people of color. Um, we know the makeup of the AHRA. I'm not sure of the makeup of the um, at the HRC, we see us in council. And so I do want to acknowledge something Alicia said is, is we need more diversity. None of us here, none of us here, all of the people of color that you see though doing our best, we do not, no matter what anyone has said, we do, we are not speakers of the whole. We do not speak for the BIPOC community as a whole. Ms. Pat speaks for the youth, as the issue has been appointed to, but in general, we do not speak for the whole town of Amherst, none, none of us, not one of us do. And I think that it puts a lot of weight and pressure and it's very, um, it just doesn't make sense to, to look at us that way. And I think also with, you know, some of the groups appointed, we can't always just be point, appointed because we are people of color. And I understand that right now there are so few of us. Um, and I hope that we continue to do the work that brings people in because we do not represent um, all voices. I do appreciate Anna um, in your, what you're saying does allow, I think for more immediate change and understanding a lot of the urgency that's been asked and has been asked, I mean, a lot of it is going to continue to go in circles because there are legislative issues and that's just what it will do. We, we already know the establishment of the police and the history in America and it's okay to say that. And it's okay to you know demand that that's looked at and implement what changes can be made. But we're sitting here often just really going around in, in circles. Um, if we're not able to kind of move along the path that Anna is suggesting, being able to look at things and say, well, what could we do now? And if we can't do this, what would need to be changed in order to do so? Um, and my other concern is just something, anything that really just moves um, Pamela and the DEI department from the center. Um, I think that we should all acknowledge that we do have a gem of resource and Pamela, I'm not speaking for her, but I imagine took a position to bring what she brings, her expertise and her talent. And some of these motions seem like she would be put into a position where she would be taking directive um, and being assistant maybe so to um, some of these committees. And I think that, you know, we also need to find a way where we allow the DEI department uh, to be able to spread their wings and do what they need to do. Um, or we did not need to bring in someone with, with Pamela's credentials. Uh, so that, you know, this is just where I am. I do appreciate um, the motions that are you know, centered around doing that with the DI department and also being able to move forward with attainable action. So we are not just having the same conversation, the same insults, we can see it coming. It is the same thing over 
and over again. And I know that we all mean well, but you can, you know, see it. It's it's really like we've heard, even with the, the comments coming from the community, thank you so much. But we're hearing this is all overlapping and being becoming very repetitive at this point. And I don't know that there's any, um, you know, win-win solution. I don't know if there's anything that's perfect, but at least something that moves us to attainable action or at least understanding what we can and cannot do. And if the results are not, if you don't like the results, let's head to the state house. If you don't like the results, then sue. Um, because how else do we move forward? Thank you. I want to just remind counselors to please stick to three minutes if possible. Dorothy? <clears throat> I would like to speak to what I see is continued obfuscation and the disease of the bureaucrat of process, process, process. Of course, it matters what we do and how we do it. But what underneath it all, what I see is a great reluctance to share the power. We spent a year setting up committees to try to get a more representative input. We have the committees. They have worked hard. They're Interesting. I mean, I never quite know exactly what they're going to say. I think they bring tremendous wealth to this town. So I say, let them do the job. I support the motion. One, these committees are not just window dressing to make us look virtuous. They're very busy people. They have jobs to do, and they're taking their time to do this work. I think we should follow Michelle's amended motion, one, and let the committees do the work and Again, I said, I like the representation of the um, police department. And it says very clearly that the town manager and DEI will be involved as they see appropriate. So I, th I think it's a great way to go. And otherwise, if this town council wants to do anything or get accomplished some of the goals that we have set out, which have to deal with other aspects of life in this town, we should let these committees, which we have created, do the job and come back to us, and then we have the right then to, to, to vote or recommend or pass on or do whatever we want to do. Thank you. I'm going to take comments from two more counselors, then I'm going to open it up for public comments so that we can then go to motions. Alicia? Um, thank you, Lynn. I actually had two questions, and one of them was going to be if we could have public comment before we vote on the motions. So that's great. The second question was, can a like committee representative or a person or persons who are on a committee serve as a community sponsor, for example, a counselor who wants to write a motion or propose something? A person or persons on a committee that is not the council have every right to approach a counselor and propose working on them on motions. Is that what you're, did that, that answer your question? Yes, but it would have to be like a person and not a committee is what like I was trying to encompass. Like could a committee be that yeah. or would it have to be a person from a committee or? It's a slippery slope, okay? And we've seen it a couple times. Um, you know, for example, a couple counselors and residents started talking about rental registration. And finally, it was time to bring it into a council committee, okay? So there's a point at which we've often had people talk to counselors and say, I'd like to support this bylaw or a general bylaw, or I'd like to support this zoning bylaw. And then those counselors have counselor or counselors have gone with that. So yes, it can be done. When it starts getting to be, you know, three people from this committee and two counselors, then we start getting into the slippery slope. Oh. Does, does that help? Lynn, if I may? Yes, please. Cite the rules. So um, our rule eight of procedure Alicia talks about how you introduce bylaws and other measures. Mm -hmm. um, and in that rule, if you're proposing a general bylaw, um, we have said that they can be initiated and introduced by submission to the council in one of the following manners by a counselor sponsor. So any one of the 13 of us by the town manager or their designee 
um, by the town committee, by a town committee, or by a group petition or initiative, which is through the charter section 8.2 and 3 and 5. Um, so if a town committee wanted to propose a bylaw to the council, they could do so. They would have to create that bylaw in open meeting, though, through their committee process. Um, zoning bylaws have a little bit more where they can come from um, through state law, but a general bylaw can come from a town committee. I hope that answers and explains it a little more. Yes, thank you. Great. And was there anything else, Alicia? No, that was it. Thank you. Okay, Shalini, last comment, and then we're going to public comment. Yeah, I just wanted to echo what Anna said that the CSSJC and uh, the CSWG before had has already proposed a path forward, which is to deal with complaints about policing, and that is to create and that is, um, you know, the DEI director doing that. So the first motion says they're going to create a process for handling future similar actions. It feels like we're going backwards. We already know the path forward is the creation of the resident oversight board. So I think we should just get to that. And as Anika mentioned, uh, we have a fabulous Black woman leading our department. We have to empower her, we have to support her, we have to believe in her, and we have to give her all the resources she needs, uh, if it's a consultant or whatever, to start working on the residence oversight board. And let's start, let's start that right now. So I really support that motion. Thank you. All right, we're going to move to public comment. I'm going to start first with the members of the CSSJC who have sat here so patiently and uh, ask if there are members of CSSJC who would like to make public comment at this time. Allegra. Um, I have a few things. Um, and I kind of see there being a need for a both and in this situation. I feel like we can both address directly the July 5th incident by approving motion one and perhaps through some combination of four through six, the majority of the CSSJC's other demands would get met. And I just wanna say that we know that council can make a motion to freeze police positions because they've done so in the past and approved it at the beginning of this conversation in 2020. Um, so if somebody would like to do that in this upcoming budget season, it's upon us, um, but I just wanted to speak, I guess I had a clarifying question um, because I'm looking at the, the motion six as Lynn amended it, which I do appreciate the inclusion of the ongoing work of HRC, CSSJC and the reparations committee. Um, I do think that that's important because we are doing this work, we've been doing this work and we would like to be active in, in these discussions in town. Um, so I guess I'm wondering what, like if, if motion six is to refer all of these things to the town manager to kind of figure out how they might work, if I'm understanding that correctly, versus Anna's motion to think about who each item would get referred to I'm just confused because I feel like motion six kind of does what what would need to be done maybe. And so I'm just wondering if 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 I'm missing something. Um, and I just I, I do think that um, I wanted to mention that there is a DEI director report from July 14th of this year that outlines the process that she's laid out for establishing the resident oversight board. So I don't think that a motion that specifically speaks to only establishing a resident oversight board is needed at this time, because I think that's already underway. Um, and I, you know, I just think that four and five don't speak directly to any repair to the youth. Um, directly impacted by this incident. I, again, some of the things might prevent 
impacts in future incidents, but that still leaves unfinished the business of July 5th. Um, so I think as me, not as a representative of everything that the committee might agree with, um, I think one in six could coexist, both specifically for the incident that occurred and again, at looking at the bigger picture of policing in Amherst. Anna, I really want to leave this for public comment and then come back, okay? All right, so I was hoping to clarify. I'd like to later. Thank you. Um, Pat. So I appreciate all the thought that the counselors who had made motions. Um, thank you. However, motion four and five, I feel it's in action. It's almost like spinning the wheel. Um, this should have happened a, a long time ago. I like um, Councillor Michelle's motion. I worry that the time frame is too far away, February. I think it's important that BIPOC people are on the same table with this with um, decision makers in this town. So I think for public perception, it's very critical that MS residents feel that the process will be transparent, that people know what is going on. And I also feel that um, involving town manager with the proposal from Councillor Michelle makes a lot of sense. Let's face it, we understand that the, council, the town council is legislative branch and the town manager actually is administrate, admi, administrator that actually make decisions. So I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards that. My only struggle with the one that Councillor Lynn put in is no mention of um, compensation fund. And I think repair will not happen if we don't address that. I feel that you know, we should try to divide the issues. Like the July 5th incident need to be addressed immediately. And I get the long term also should also be addressed. But for the immediate where we where we're meeting, should take priority in order for us to heal. But um that's what I'm leaning toward, towards. Um, I just want to make sure that the voices of the youth are centered when whatever the town council in the vote on, that we have BIPOC folks trying to represent what the voices of the youth and their families be included in, in, in all the process. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. D. So I'm just going to agree with um, a combination of one and six. I think we need to attend to the short term as indicated by some of the, the counselors and then uh, attend to the long term um, issues having to do with um, police uh, policies and practices. Resident Oversight Board, when we envisioned it, we were looking at various models. It's important that our, as everyone you know, has noted, our very bright and capable DEI director. Um, it's, a, it's a process in many towns where there is an executive committee set up, small, to help make those decisions with the DEI director kind of as the executive director, but a committee set up uh, to then build uh, a resident oversight board or in some communities, um, a commission on police practices, which does very similar work. So I just think, you know, there's nothing within here that takes up you know, how the resident oversight board 
is to be built and um, create it. So I, you know, that would have that would have been helpful further down the line. But for right now, looking at these motions, I think the um, the revised number one uh, with a combination of six, I could see that working. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Deborah, are you home safely? Yep, I'm, I'm available. I'm home now. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, of course, I was driving this whole time, so I wasn't able to um, write down anything in terms of the motion. So I'm not sure which one is which and all of those things. So what I'm going to speak to is just what I I feel would be most effective. Um, I do like one. Um, however, I still have some questions about one, um, which is, OK, you're getting all of our committees together to 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 come up with recommendations but what does that mean right so are those recommendations going to be put in place by the town council or is it going to be again the runaround of we bring these recommendations and then you know maybe they're going to be put in place maybe they're not going to be put in place you know which is going to waste time um for the july 5th you know um violations and you know, the, the remedies that we want for, uh, you know, our young people and the families and obviously for, for the healing. So I think even with one, even though I like it, there needs to be some type of, okay, what is happening here? You know what I'm saying? What, what does that mean, right? Because if not, we're just spinning our wheels. And so then, and then I like what Anna had brought up and Alicia had talked about it too, almost kind of combining that into one if, if, if that gap was addressed in terms of what these recommendations mean, which is to say, yeah, we already had a list, right? CSS, JC that we brought up. So why couldn't we have this group, right? Working with, because right, other councils are gonna be part of this group and, you know, and we'd be working with the town council, I mean, yeah, with the town manager and the DEI folks. So it'd be this smaller group kind of working with everyone. Why couldn't we have this group kind of look at you know, the list of demands that we have and really kind of figure it out, right? Why can't we respond to each, right? So combining the two, because I think that there it's, it's just gonna waste more time and we don't have more time. The, uh, the town has, has spoken, like this happened in July. Why are we now going to be going into, uh, God knows what, another six months to address these issues? We have the list that CSSJC brought up and we have committees and, and, and folks that could work on this together. So why, um, why can't we just you know, get this done as opposed to kind of prolonging it? And then in terms of the oversight, that was already, I mean, the DI director already has a timeline in terms of putting the oversight committee in place. I like maybe providing her with a consultant so it can happen quicker, because I know she said that it would be too much for her to do and it wouldn't be in place until next year. So what we're dealing with in terms of creating this group is a short term, but obviously we need the longer term, which is the resident oversight. So yes, providing her with a consultant, yes, but we don't have to go and, you know, oh, should we have a resident? No, we've been there, done that. You know, the, 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 the train has left the station. So the only thing that we could do is add a consultant so that it can get done more quickly. Thanks, Deb. Uh, Philip. Yeah, I'll echo what um, my fellow CSSJC members said. I like the idea of uh, one and a combination of six, and then to kind of piggyback off of what Deborah was saying, uh, the motions and counselors focus on the resident oversight. Uh, Pamela has said that there's a timeline for it, but to Deb's point, it is a timeline with a small staff and if this town council has given this budget to the DEI department to not expand the staff, to not expand other people, which we have talked about in our CSSJC meetings, then maybe an outside consultant does need to be brought in. So that focus to me, again, kind of goes back to what Andrew was saying, or Andy was saying about money and figuring out money and Councilor Haneke as well, kind of saying, which one does a council kind of put and hold 
more valuable. Right now we have money going to the library. Right now we have money going to the school. We just got a grant to have money go to the sidewalks. When are we going to focus on the racial issues of this town and where are we going to find the money and the time to deal with that? And I'll leave with that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to now go to the audience and I see two hands, uh, Alexis and Ronnie Parker. Are there any other people who would like to make public comment at this time? Make, I see a third or fourth. All right, let's start. Alexis, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Um, hi, sorry, can people hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Alexis Reed and I live on West Street. Um, I, I want to thank Councillor Walker for her comments because she spoke directly to my frustrations. Um, as a body that made a proclamation to create an anti-racist Amherst, which the success of that can only be determined by the victims of racism, it's very unsettling, especially as members elected into this position of power when there's confusion about what you can do to take action on your own proclamation. Um, it sounds like headway has been made here tonight, though, but like as a member of the AHRA that must rely on your action and votes for anything to actually manifest out of the fund, this sentiment of like, what, what can we do or are we supposed to be a part of this restitution is troubling to say the least, um, especially from counselors who appear to be very knowledgeable about the charter and its powers. Um, Anti-racism is the active process of identifying and eliminating racism, changing systems, organizational structures, policies and practices in order to redistribute power. And we've been able to identify it in various committees. And I'm thankful for the committees and that I've been given an opportunity to fight for my family in this assembly. But um, who is actually doing the anti-racist work here? Only you have the power to implement changing the systems and redistributing power and putting them into actions like Councillor Devlin Gothier said. Um, the conversation on priorities is telling us that we're not really ready to make this commitment. Um, we want to, but we're not ready to do so with the powers that be in Amherst. And that's fine, but let's be honest about where we are right now with our community community if we can't make the financial commitments. Um, please reflect deeply on what Ms. Ferreira said about who feels safe even calling the police for help. Ms. Onanibaku spoke from her real and valuable experience. Respectability politics should not be weaponized against the real hurt and anger of our BIPOC community members. How comfortable should we make how should someone make you feel in defending their own humanity and experience, especially when being appointed to recommend actions that would affect their lives in Amherst? Various counselors have been able to come to the defense of the police in countless meetings, regardless of who that alienates amongst the community. And when members of the community speak against them, suddenly we need to come together. So I'm, I'm really asking you, we need to um, make the choice and to walk the walk together. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Ronnie Parker. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, um, oh my God. I am so sort of horrified really by this conversation. I, um, I just don't even know what to say. We're here to talk about some children, our children who've been humiliated who are suffering trauma and will suffer trauma. You've heard data about it, but you can ask any dark person who has ever found herself in public looking like a poor person. You ask any person, they will tell you a story and they will tell you about the length of the trauma. And I can tell you mine, but I'm not going to because I just have so much more to say. In terms of what you actually have to do, I think there's too much bureaucracy, too much budget discussion. It's very clear what you have to do. You have to, whoever is in charge has to talk to the police officers through whatever channels to make an apology. We heard that they felt bad. They felt bad because they did something wrong. They would like to correct it. There's no budget required for that, but it seems like there's no, um, personal authority or commitment. There's even question, oh, this happened, let's let it go. Oh, nothing happened, which is the worst of all because that's what happened to me in my encounter with the police. Nothing happened because I shouldn't have been stopped to begin with. But I can tell you, it took me 10 years to go to my local police department to talk about it. So don't deny their trauma. 
address it. And how do we address it? People say the town manager, this committee, that committee. Well, when you tell the town manager to do something, he doesn't personally do it. He looks at a whole slew of resources that he has and he assigns it to somebody who knows about that. So we have a town committee that knows about this, that has expertise in it. It's your committee. It's our committee. It's a committee that the town manager believes consists of experts. So I don't know why it's a question since it hasn't worked out to give them a chance to do their job, to bring their expertise to bear on this issue. So I'm completely with number one, uh, what, whatever number it was, Michelle Miller's uh, proposal. The only question I would have about it is why are there three town councilors? I personally don't feel that the town councilors get it for the most part. It's not about you. It's not about your accomplishments and all the great things that you did. You're not the victims here. It's these kids. And they're hardly mentioned in this discussion, which makes me very upset. And as far as the discussion of the consultant, uh, I actually did recommend a consultant to the DEI director in a conversation with her. I believe, and she knew this person and had worked with her, I believe the consultant is needed for the town council and for the senior town management. You don't need a consultant to tell us about Amherst. You've got the SJCC. You've got people right there, right here. They're part of our system. Let's draw on them. You don't need a budget for them to work. You don't need to, a new budget line. Let's draw on them. So I think we should... But I believe very strongly from my heart, and I hope you're not insulted, that the town council and the town, just as well, the town leadership at, across the board really needs uh, somebody from the outside to help increase awareness about racism in this town. And I don't mean that as a good and evil thing, but that we're all socialized in ways that make it impossible for us to see certain perspectives and somebody mentioned perspectives and I think that there's a lack of perspective as far as um, the other is concerned here so uh, I guess I've hit the zero mark on my timer uh, so thank you Kathleen Traphagen please enter the room state your name and where you live Hi, thanks. Um, my name is Kathleen Traffig and I live in District 2. Um, and thank you everybody for still being in this meeting, um, first of all. Um, so I think a lot of the things that the two previous commenters said, I absolutely second. Um, as a white person, I am I am also like, what, what can I say? I will say, I just want to acknowledge the pain and disbelief and anger and incredulous reactions by the people of color tonight that are on the screen and I'm sure on the Zoom. I am so sorry that we have been hearing from people that you have told us and told us and told us that the police do not keep you safe. And you have told us and told us and told us what it is like to live in this town and experience the racism that you do. And I am really disappointed by some of the things that have been brought up by some counselors tonight where it is clear that you just still don't get it and you are still not believing and you are still unable to put yourself, even try to put yourself in shoes that are not your own. And really white people, we have to do better. We have to do better here. So I heard some things about Oh, all police interactions are terrible for everybody. So how on earth do we decide what to do? I have heard some things about, oh, this police officer, it's very important to understand the context in which they said that a person has no rights. I've heard many things that have just taken the matter of race right out of any of the motions or even the discussion. We cannot do this. We need to move forward. And first of all, we need to have the police department apologize. How does that happen? That is actually a question. I know you're not gonna to react to the comment because of the rules, but somebody has got to have the police department apologize. Can you guys talk about that and figure out how that's going to happen, please? Any motion has to include accountability, repair, restoration. 
and it needs to focus on the systemic racism in this town. So let's stop getting caught up in all of these other things that you're bringing up. Councillor Haneke had a question about why we don't just have the town manager do something and why we would involve the committees that we have, that you all have actually appointed that are mostly the black and brown people. Why, Councillor Haneke, is because we need to center the voices of black and brown people in this and white people need to step down. That's why. I really believe you should hear that and understand that by now. That's all I've got. Guinevere, please enter the room and state your name and where you live. Yes, hello, my name is Gwen Nabad. And um, when I saw that this was being heard in Amherst um, tonight, I was actually at a meeting and I came in late, but I wanted to be here because, well, I wanted to listen to what's being said because I don't live in Amherst, but I had a very uh, bizarre encounter with misogyny with the Amherst police. And so when I saw that this was happening tonight, I decided to come listen and I'm so glad that I did. And, you know, a lot of what I hear tonight is more delay, more, let's do more research. Let's do more of this. And maybe the people that did this were not qualified but I believe that the people that are most qualified are the people that have these experiences. And um, there's no point, you know, the thing is like, I mean, first and foremost, the first thing that just is coming to my mind is the uh, concept of public trust and how critical it is at children's different points in development to have a nice relationship with the authority in the homes that they live in, let alone BIPOC youth. They are the most vulnerable. And, you know, it's just, I, I guess it's really hard to understand why this is still lingering since July. I, I do remember reading about this, but what I'm seeing a lot tonight is just, the continuing cycle of systemic racism, um, the use of regulations to perpetuate the abuse of power that, that people experience. And like, that's exactly why our nation is in the condition that it is right now, because there's a serious imbalance of power and everyone who's serving tonight is in a position of public trust. And so, I mean, I, I can't even compare as, as a white mother, single mother, I can't even still compare my experience to the things that I've seen in the whitest towns of Massachusetts. And I think that Amherst really needs to lead on this. Um, it's, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a deeply embedded history. It's, it's, it's like sometimes not even conscious that these underlying biases and ways of knowing and being and, um, you know, the way that people are read or profiled, it's, it's so embedded. It's so embedded through so many generations of trauma and erasure. And the erasing happens with delays and then the changing of guards once again, and somebody drops the ball. And so that's what I have to say about this. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Uh Lauren Mills, please enter the room, state your name, where you live. Yes, hi, good evening, you can hear me, or good night. 
Um, Ryan Mills, District 5, um, I have a few points that I'd like to share. I appreciate um, all the public speakers that just spoke. And I appreciate those counselors who do get it. One being Dorothy Pam, I appreciate you. I had the question in my mind, who forces a forced apology? And like some of the other callers have mentioned, and CSJC, one of the requests, and I'm sure from the families as well, is an apology from the police chief. And I would also like to know what the process is for, for that and how that can be accomplished. Also at the listening session of the first um, AHRA um, public listening session, um, a counselor mentioned counseling. And if that is recommended, who would pay for that counseling? And um, I, I think that would be a good start. If, that, if that's something that um, is willing to be provided, you know, I think it, it, should, be, it should be pursued for, for the families. Um, I would also just suggest to count, town council members to maybe uh, set up a meeting with you um, starting with the middle school. I have two um, sons that go to the middle school and maybe your perspectives would be opened more if you, you know, talk to the youth of this, this community of this town. And I would just really strongly suggest that you, you know, speak and, and hear what the youth have to say in this town. And just lastly, um, a council member, council member mentioned, you know, who is accountable for a pair. And I think for me, the, the answer is we are all accountable. We are all accountable for the repair. Thank you. Brianna Owen, please enter the room. Hi everyone. Um, I hope everyone listening and those who will who will re-listen later open the packet from this evening and read Mr. William Stewart's email. It illustrates the corruption that happens within the town and this is just the first time it's in our face and we cannot ignore it. This meeting I've heard counselors say they've answered the trauma endured by the BIPOC community through programs like CRESS, the DEI department, and the creation of the CSSJC. You have all halfway funded every recommendation the CSWG has put forth. In fact, the CSSJC's mistreatment is a perfect example that nothing about the town council has grown to be more inclusive since the first time these discussions have started. I read Mr. Williams, I read Mr. William Stewart's letter over and over and over again before this meeting. Amherst is not equitable. Not everyone feels safe here. Not everybody feels represented. Not everyone feels free to speak. People in this town have been brutalized physically, emotionally, and mentally by the police department, by town staff, by community members, and by each of the counselors that have tried and continue to try to minimize the trauma experienced by underrepresented folks in this community. Denial is not the way to change. Denial is not the way to change. Denial is not the way to change. Thank you. Isolda Ortega Bustamante, please enter the room. Good evening. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, Isolda Ortega, uh, District 5, um, Amherst. And I just wanted to very briefly, much has been said and thank you to everyone who has made a statement and has been working on these issues nonstop. Uh, we've heard that uh, an admission is needed, a reconciliation, repair, reform, accountability, and amends. And these are all um, important concepts that have been mentioned and have been explained in writing uh, and uh, reports submitted already. Um, the one uh, area that may be in here that I haven't seen 
Uh, you can point me to it if I missed uh, it in one of the motions. Um, and what is that is the direct connection to the police contract. So the question is for any aspect of admission, reconciliation, repair, reform, accountability, and amends, what is the connection there to changing aspects or clauses in the police contract? Because without a through line to the contract, the, um, the incident um, could be analyzed. Uh, it could even hopefully be repaired, amended. You may even see some reform, but to have a sustainable systemic change, there needs to be a connection to the police contract. I have heard uh, members of CSSJC tonight support motion one from council uh, woman um, Miller. And I know that you are combining it with other motions uh, tonight. Um, and that sounds uh, fantastic. Um, you have already a working and established uh, group of committees, already uh, CSSJE, the HRA. Um, and I understand the references to the progress uh, made with the DEI and CRESS offices, but I think it's really important to put that in a, on a timeline. <laughs> These are very new positions. These are very new programs with extremely large and ambitious portfolios. And to put them in a position of suddenly having to analyze an incident of this nature um, didn't do them any favors. Um, and as we have heard tonight, there was um, eyewitness accounts lacking, et cetera. So going forward, given the respect for their position and the charge that you've given them, they would be um, much better suited to work in collaboration um, with CSSJC, with the HRA, and with others um, uh, in a more collaborative manner to get to the bottom of this. Um, the other comment I wanted to make is that in addition to a tie-in to the police contract and clauses in the contract, that there has to be a timeline outlined for this that is not um, waiting for more analysis. So for example, you could say that from July 5th, uh, it shouldn't go beyond December 5th, that you that there is at least a first step that's concrete and, and public in this that's more acceptable to all, all parties. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Zoe, please enter the room, state your name and where you're from. Hey everybody, uh, this is Zoe Crabtree from District 5 again. Um, I just uh, wanted to reiterate and uplift something that uh, I heard uh, Councillor Walker say and that I was reflecting upon as well as folks were going through the motions, um, which is that we already have a review of police department rules and regulations and procedures. Um, I don't know if any of those specifically addressed uh, police department rules, regulations, and procedures in relation to uh, incidents with youth. Um, but it it is very frustrating, again, to, to hear uh, the desire for more research and more review um, when the, the first batch of recommendations from extensive research um, that included, uh, you know, outside professional uh, consultants to create um, haven't been fully taken up. So um, just wanted to second that for you, Alicia, that it sounds like other folks are also feeling that in addition to you and I. Um, Meg Gage, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi everyone, I'm Meg Gage. I live in North Amherst. Can you hear me? We can. I'm a, earbuds here. Uh, thank you all for this hard work. I really appreciate it. And this is a huge struggle for all of us. Uh, I'm gonna not go back to how long in my life I've been dealing with all these things, but I appreciate Amherst, which has been bold. I'm, I'm concerned about our ability to focus longer 
forward and the programs that we've created. Amherst has been bold in, in creating new programs to tackle in our small way, centuries of unimaginable cruelty, uh, crimes and suffering. The uh, CRESS program and the DEI program are up and running and it's taken a lot of effort. And I just wanna be sure that we're focusing on those as well as what we're dealing with right now. Uh, we've hired extraordinary leaders in these two programs, Pamela and Earl and Deborah. And uh, we have a strong African-American reparations assembly, which has been uh, supported by the council as well. Uh, we urgently, urgently need to pull together to assure that these programs advance. And I'm concerned that we're gonna be stuck here and not move forward with the, some of the things that we've been working on. We need to uh, learn how to deal with harm, which is very real without creating more harm. Uh, I probably, I'm so late, I'm gonna just be very brief. I really urge all of us to bring our highest collaborative selves to work together to, to find the best path forward. There's a Smith faculty woman, uh, Loretta Ross, a recent MacArthur Fellowship winner advises when engaging in disagreements, it's better, better than calling people out is to call instead call people in. And I'm worried that we're so antagonistic right now that we're not working together to find forward paths. Uh, it's, it's so late at night, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna say more, but uh, this is really hard work that everybody needs to pay attention to. And I really appreciate uh, everything everyone's doing. And we need, to, we need to work together. How can we work together rather than antagonistically? It's very hard. Sorry, too late at night to be very articulate. It's almost 11 o'clock. Ah. <laughs> good night, everybody. I'm not good night, but thank you. Thanks, Meg. Vera Cage, please enter the room. Hi, Vera Cage. Amherst. Um, Hold on. I'm sorry, Vera. We have to bring you back in or we have to unmute you. What did you do? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We okay, had a little technical changed. snafu there, Vera, sorry. So in 2010, I, along with my husband and his family and um, his nephews, friends, we and community members, we launched Justice for Charles. Charles Wilhite was wrongfully convicted of murder and was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. That was in 2010. I quit my job to help my nephew get out of serving in maximum security prison. He was not even 30 years old. I visited Ludlow Jail to visit him for the first time I stepped into the jail cell. I will made a commitment to his grandmother, my late mother-in-law, that we would get him out. She was able to see him freed during the second trial. But I quit my graduate assistant, assistantship job at UMass to work on his case full time as a volunteer. I will go to the depths of the earth to make sure these nine young people get the justice they are due. Let's talk about due process. Some of these comments irritate me because there is a presumption of guilt already. These kids have not even been tried. These kids are not guilty, but there is a presumption of guilt. But the police, they get a pass. Barely anyone questions what they assert to be thorough, complete, or true. 
the onus is on these nine youths to present their story. And Mr. Paul Balkerman, our town manager, has the power to facilitate the most humane path for justice for these nine youth that will be listening, recording, and documenting how you all have behaved, your comments, as will the rest of us. Let's ask attorney Howard Friedman, how he was able to, in my own knowledge, obtain settlement agreements for his two clients, separate cases against the Amherst PD. Let's talk about the police insurance, the deductible that the town of Amherst pays. Let's ask Mr. Town Manager Paul Balkerman about those avenues. He holds a lot of answers. He holds a lot of information. And he is eerily quiet, too quiet for my own satisfaction. Please get away from this addiction to want to watch and witness suffering, especially black and brown suffering. You want the gore, you want the pain, you want the blood, you want the torture. That's what you're doing with every minute of this meeting, with every day and every week and every month that these children have not had a resolution to what they are presenting to you, to this town. Everyone should be treated with courtesy and respect and with the presumption of innocence. The police didn't do that July 5th. They sat those kids down on a sidewalk and lined them up like they were suspects. And do you know why some of these kids don't want to speak? Because they know the trajectory, because they are part of a long line of our history, a legacy of this history. Because in a couple of years, in a year, some of these kids will turn adults. And you know what police do to these children when they become adults? They really go after them. That's the reality that these kids experience and know too, all too well, and that many of you are so disconnected from. I can't believe that some of you will be able to expound on something that you have very little knowledge of and be very comfortable about speaking to things and making advice and suggestions about very, the things that you know very little of. And you do not respect the people that hold the knowledge, like Mrs. Pat Ononabaku. But you wanna create all these committees, create all this diversion to avoid the point that you are, the town is guilty of harm and they need, you all need to address it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that concludes public comment. And uh, we are going to go back to the council and I am uh, ready to entertain a motion. I'm sorry. Michelle. Look, could I clarify something? Yeah. Do we have a motion on the table now? Uh, or was Michelle's formal withdrawal, like was that Thank you. withdrawal and actual withdrawal so that a motion would be a new one versus a substitute? No, let's do this formally. Michelle, there's a motion on the table. It's been made and seconded. I'm calling on you because it was your motion. Yes, I'd like to withdraw my motion and uh, offer um, a new motion, please. <clears throat> and is it, to be read again, or? I, let me see if I can, are you sharing screen, Sean, or shall I? I, I need to be given permission. I need to be made co-host to do this. You have the sheet.
If you don't, I can, but you need to make me co-host to do that. We, I'm sorry, we, Athena, who is on Tuesday night says class in Boston, needed to leave her location so she could make the last train home. And so we're working with a slightly different um, crew. Okay, I, I, am, I can now share the motions. Okay, uh, the substitute and turn the motions. Okay. Okay, the motion that is on the screen is the motion that was made and seconded on October 17th. And my understanding from Michelle is that has been officially withdrawn. Well, a point of clarification, I believe the seconder has to also um, agree to that withdrawal since Athena is not here to, to thank you. do I, that for I us. I appreciate all of that. And I believe uh, Alicia, you were the seconder. Are you willing to withdraw this motion? Yes, thank you. Okay, if that, we can allow that. Okay, now, Michelle, do you want yes. me to go to the next motion? Yes, please. Okay. All right, and this is the substitute motion that Michelle spoke to earlier. Michelle, what would you like to say about this? Oh, I think that um, I've already spoken to it. And um, I think that the members of the CSSJC and the public that have spoken support this motion. And I hope my fellow um, counselors will also support it and perhaps in combination with other motions that have been um, recommended tonight. So uh, unless there's some reason that I have to read it line by line, I'm officially making the motion and, and I'm, I'm looking for a second. Second, Walker. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any uh, questions that people would like to raise or so forth? Yeah. Andy? Uh, just in clarification, the, acid, the, the uh, second paragraph of the motion, which is in italics, isn't that the withdrawn motion? Yes, um, Andy, originally when I had submitted this with our drafts yesterday by noon, I had submitted it as a draft um, to uh, reconsider as opposed to withdrawing the original. So Lynn and I talked about using that language move to substitute the following motion. But what I've done here tonight is ask for that uh, original motion to be completely withdrawn and then um, to have a new motion, which I've spoken to already. Okay. So let me just, uh, just make sure that I understand that that italicized paragraph is not part of the substitute motion one. No, not at all. Okay. I just needed to bring take that down for a moment because I needed to put the review up so I can track changes. Now I can go back and I can put it up on the screen. You might have a helpful hand hand from Athena who showed up. I'm going to. So you're going to call on people, Anna. Oh, I what? No, uh, Athena has is is here. I'm saying she's oh. back. Like it's magic. Athena, can you see people's hands? Um, I can. I was just going to suggest that we change that, you know, if, 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 uh, if that's yeah. agreeable to, to change rather than to substitute that we just cut that. So it would say to create the ad hoc committee to develop a proposal for repair as presented below and then cut out the paragraph in italics. I, I, I am happy to call on hands if that's that's not what I was suggesting. Athena was here to do. I just noticed she had her hand up. Okay. So the motion's been made and seconded. Who's next to speak? Can we just clarify that, that that's an agreeable amendment, a friendly amendment? I've already yeah. drawn a line through it. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> and, and Alicia agrees as well? Oh, yes. Sorry. Thank you, Athena. Thank you. That's what I was asking for. Michelle has her hand up. Oh, right. Michelle? 
Oh, no, I'm sorry. I do not have my hand up. I apologize. Okay. I'm going to. Do I? Sorry. Go ahead. Pat. Keep it moving. Yeah, Let's keep it moving. I'm old. I'm slow. Um, I'll keep it moving as fast as I can. Uh, I'm looking at your the uh, co uh, composition of the committee of the ad hoc committee, and you have one non-voting community liaison member of the APD. I'm very uh, interested in why there would not also be a member of CREFS and or DEI as part of the actual committee, even if they're non-voting. Um, like oh, I know that it says later, the APD, DEI and CRESS will participate in relevant discussions as needed. But I think that the, those are ongoing voices that um, become critical to the kind of exploration this is. Thank you, Pat. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Originally, I did have a non-voting member from CRESS as well as from the Amherst um, high school uh, staff. And then I realized that um, it may be considered potentially too clunky in that way. Um, but I fully support that. And if the staff is available to participate in that manner, um, then I would support if if that if you wanted to add that Pat as an amendment to this. May I speak to that? Um, I would specifically like to see Cress, a representative of Cress, to be added. Um, okay. You, all right. Uh, Kath, uh, Athena, your hand is still up. Would you like to make a comment? Uh, Kathy? Um, if you can scroll down to um, a set of bullets that the committee shall, thank you. Um, Michelle, you said earlier you are talking about changing examining protocols looking to the future. I don't see it in the wording here. So for example, it says harms, and then the next one says research and explored models for repair. So there's the word repair, pay. Mm -hmm. uh, there's never anything in this that I can see that talks about look at protocols, follow up, apology. So we would talk about preventing such things in the future. So that's why I called it narrow. I think this is all focused on July 5th and it assumes reparations. Um, which might be changing of protocols, but I don't read the repair as the same of do differently. So I'm all, I've am been hearing throughout that if there had been a real apology earlier and we should have a different way of working with youth on noise complaints. So I, I just don't see it here. Um, and if that is the way you want it to read, I, I still think this is quite narrow in focusing on one incident. Michelle, would you like to respond? I would. Thank you, Anna. Yeah. So I think um, what it says here, research and explore models for repair, including procedural policy and compensatory options. So in my mind, that means procedural. How have we, how do we manage when these incidents arise? And we've all acknowledged that they will arise again. Policy, what sort of policy changes need to take place um, to repair this incident and um, future incidents? in my mind. Um, and that is covered by uh, developing a proposed plan for repair that includes concrete process for handling future similar incidents. So I do not think this is narrow only to the July 5th incident. I think it uses the incident um, as uh, a focal point to then also recommend to the council concrete process for handling future similar incidents. I'm gonna call on Paul and then come back, Paul. Um, thank you. Um, so I want to um, delve a little bit more into what expectations you have for staff. As you know, we have very talented leaders at the um, 
crest department a dei department i do want to say that scott livingstone is one of the strongest and best uh, police chiefs that i have ever seen in the state of massachusetts he has also been very progressive in how he has approached things um the i can tell you the dei director has three other committees that she is managing um, she has a lot of other things on her plate we are working together to figure out her workload and to ensure that she is can be successful in her job with what she's supposed to do for the town. Cress is in the middle of developing a really robust program. You know, Earl, as you know, is here six days, seven days a week. We're forcing these people to not come to work some days so that they can maintain their ability to complete the tasks with which they've been assigned. Uh, my time is elastic, so I'm happy for you to put me anywhere. But um, in terms of my staff, um, in terms of the DEI director, I can tell you she believes believes that she has concluded her reports on the July 5th incident and doesn't, doesn't think that she can contribute much more to that, that particular incident. She's happy to support, but I, I just want to make sure it's clear that we can provide administrative support for sure to another major committee, which has a very large charge. I mean, these are looking at really big things over a very tight timeline. Um, so just to, I want to be very clear with the council that in terms of staff support, we'll give you as much administrative support as you need. But in terms of the professional staff, I, I would caution how much time they will be able to devote to this. I just want, I'm trying to be realistic because we are having these conversations on a daily basis about um, job sustainability and people being able to continue in their jobs with the, with the workload that we're putting on them. Mandy. I, I'm going to change a little bit of my thoughts um, or comments. Paul, thank you for that. Um, as um, reviews come out next week from counselors, I am, you know, as what Paul stated, I'm very concerned about what we ask of our staff and how much we ask. We ask a lot um, and we don't ever add much staff. Um, and, you know, that goes to this motion in terms of the town manager, APD, DEI, Crest director to participate in relevant discussions as needed. Um, uh, Anika indicated that the thought might be that they're needed for all of the discussions, but do they have the time? I don't know. I can't answer that. I can only listen to our town manager to say they're already stretched really thin. Um, by a lot of what we've asked them to do already. Um, I worry that this charge um, asks the committee to reinvestigate. It doesn't use those words. It says establish consensus on the factual record um, of what transpired and establish consensus on the factual record of the follow-up. Um, but it doesn't talk about what the committee will use to establish that consensus. Um, I, you know, are they going to use the DEI report and addendum, the police report and addendum? We've heard many people specifically from the CSSJC say they don't believe those reports are sufficient. There's a dispute as to whether those dis reports are su sufficient, I would say. Um, we just heard the town manager say the DEI director believes her reporting on this incident is done. Um, but if there's belief that those aren't sufficient and belief that they are sufficient, I hesitate to say we can establish consensus without further investigating. I don't know the answer to that. I worry that we'd be creating an investigatory body without much say in how they investigate and without, frankly, any authority in how to investigate. Committees don't have authority to go into and read private and, you know, non-public documents. Um, so that's one of my concerns with some specific language in here. Um, the other concern is not really a concern, but more of a question. 
And I think this was asked by um, another CSSJC member. Um, what are we going to do with the proposed plan? Is the assumption that we will adopt the proposed plan? Because if that's the assumption, I've got more concerns. Um, or is the assumption that proposed plan will come here and then it might go off to another committee of the council to review to see whether we want to um, adopt some all, none, change stuff and all of that? What What's the action afterward? And I guess that goes back to if we know as a council what we want, why not just ask the town manager to do it with consulting? I think the motion six says using and consulting some of these, these committees too, but why not just say do that? Why create a committee? So I'm, I'm not sure I can support this yet, but I'm still thinking hard on it. But those are some of my questions and concerns. Thank you, Shalini. Um, again, again, I want to reiterate that yes, there is racism in our town. There is profiling um, that has been shared by some of the people in our um, amongst us today. That's been shared and in the from the public, and and that needs to stop. It's not going to stop overnight, but we need to take the actions and hopefully tonight to make that stop. Um, the other issue that I want to really highlight is that by creating a committee, a working group to do the job that we have hired a DEI director to do, to create a process forward, to set up the residence oversight board, we're setting a bad precedent where we hire black leaders, but we don't give them the power to lead. We need to let her not only do her job, we need to clear the road for her to do, to do the job, not add more things for her to even look at this and to even look at that. We need to give her the consultant if she needs so that she can do it in a faster uh, manner. And And I don't know. I just feel that the motion that the alternatives that are out there are going to get us to start acting and um, on what is needed. And secondly, there was one other point I had in my mind, which was, it'll come to me in a moment. Ah, deep breaths. Okay. Um, okay, maybe I'm going to come back to you with the second point I was going to make, but. Yeah, come back. Okay. Um, I'm going to call on myself briefly. And, you know, I think if, if I'm not able to support this motion and I'm still trying to, trying to process through it in my head, the reason is that and I apologize if I sound repetitive, I think, you know, my, my concern is that if we do this, are we negating the things that CSSJC has already written to us as the list of things they'd like to see happen? Because we're now going to say, forget that we're going to, we're going to form this new group. And, and I see you shaking your head, Michelle, hang on, let me, let me finish my sentence, please. And we're going to wait to see what comes out of this committee instead. And so my concern is how are we, how are we doing both if this committee is answering a question that CSSJC has written an answer to in their letter to us before. So I still have, and, and that's not every single bullet point on this list. There's just a few on here that I think that's where I'm seeing that overlap that I'm concerned about. Um, because I, I think that what I'm hearing is that action is the priority right now and uh, or action is one of the priorities right now. And I don't want to do things that are um, slowing that down. So that's, that's where my, um, my challenge with this is right now is, is I am concerned that we have a lot of the answers to this already. Um, and they've been given to us by 
the the committee that we put together to work on community safety and social justice. So that's where I'm that's where my head's at. I wanted to share that. Dorothy. Okay. So um in teaching logic to um, community college students, sometimes we talk about creating a straw man. And I do feel that that is one of the things that's happening here is creating a straw man that somehow we can divert our attention from what we're doing. I think the motion is good. Um, I think that some people are uncomfortable with it because um, you want to know ahead of time how it's going to turn out and you want to control it. And the idea is we will not totally control it. We have these committees and, and, and who will be drawn upon to presenting some members to a new committee that will control it. I really think we should go ahead and let that happen. Uh, but I have a question for the town manager. When we said we wanted to add uh, CRES and DEI, it was because we wanted to make sure that their input was given where they wanted to give it and where they felt it was necessary. Um, you are the one who knows what they can do and can't do. And we have spoken to you a couple of times saying that, that we felt that you did overburden some of the staff. So I see that you're really trying to respond to that. So um, I just think that you could give your opinion a little bit more strongly, Mr. Bockelman. What do you think in terms of, uh, should we leave this staff, this committee as it is, or should we, uh, with just the, um, the rep non-voting representative of the APD and only bring in CRES when needed, is that adequate? Um, so I just want your opinion on that. So I guess I don't really know what the non-voting representative from APD means really, um, uh, what their role would be. And it would be important to understand that. Right. Um, I can tell you that we are building two brand new departments um, and that Pamela and Earl are working eons and, and right. we're in a, um, I want them to continue their work that they were hired to do. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important. This is an important committee. If the if the council feels this is an important committee, you can certainly um, create it. That's that's totally within your purview. I'm just what I'm saying is, as terms of staffing, I cannot mm -hmm. commit that. Um, you know, especially the Earl and Pamela. Right. But you okay. know, we'll be able to. You know, the police chief has a bigger staff, obviously. Uh, Earl okay. doesn't have the sub. You know, the, the developed staff that he needs. He's building that program. Um, and Pamela is tapped out, um, yeah, quite yeah. honestly. Um, okay. And so it's been pretty clear in terms of where mm -hmm. my job as a manager of people right. is to make sure that they're able to continue in their jobs successfully, mm -hmm. that, they, that the things that we give them, we give them tools to be successful and that they are able to do it within the time frame of the hours that for which we pay them. Mm -hmm. and I'm making a big emphasis of this right now because we put a lot of burdens on our staff and yeah. it is, we had a meeting this morning of our department heads and it was palpable what department heads are saying or their, their staffs are feeling. Um, mm -hmm. And it's and it's not just, I'll be honest with you, it's, it's not just the work that they're doing, what's happening with individual staff and how staff are being treated in public meetings is felt, felt by everybody. And I think that that's um, really disturbing to everybody. Um, Sean was in the meeting, he, he can attest to it, um, because when the staff hear criticisms of, of, the, of, of their fellow leaders, I mean, other department heads, and they feel that, you know, that could be me, and they start to, not like, and one staff member said, I've got a kid going to college, what does this mean for me? You know, they're worried about things like that. So mm -hmm. in my hat today, and, I, and this is totally like, the issues that people brought to up today, I mean, Councillor Walker and, and Philip were just so powerful. And so this seems, re, you know, minuscule compared to the feelings that they had. And that was just really meaningful to me. But my hat I am wearing today is in terms of managing staff for the town of Amherst. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to convey that. And it's really not to compare that at all to what 